Gauteng, uh, as led by uh, uh, M.E.C. Sufi. I got an apology from the from the premier who's on quarantine. Uh, so Honorable Le Sophie is leading the delegation. Then we want to welcome you, the colleagues from Gauteng, and then uh, as and when they start the presentation, they will also tell us uh, who is in attendance. So we want to welcome the opportunity to interact with yourselves, uh, the Houghton Provincial Government on your plans to address the resurgence of the COVID-19 cases in the province. We, as the province is the home of 15 million people and responsible for more than 34% of the country's gross domestic uh, product, its response its, its response is, is more is very critical in this uh, because its response to the surge of infection will have a significant effect uh, uh, on the impact of the national uh, in, uh, impact of the national impact on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, it is therefore imperative for the province to slow down the rate of infection, which is currently doubling every 15 days. It is the second fattest after the KZN uh, province. Slowing down the rate of infection, however, is obviously only half the battle colleagues. As much as we need to prevent the virus from infecting more people, it also therefore imperative to afford those already infected adequate treatment and adequate care, and also to improve their chances of recovery. But we are also therefore uh, welcoming the news that the province is re registering an increased rate of recoveries, and that is now leading in terms of the recoveries in the country. That's the thing that we are pleased about. And then also we are pleased to count among the recoveries uh, of the other prominent members and officials of the provincial government. Uh, colleagues will agree with us that uh, the fight against COVID-19 is about saving lives, but also about protecting livelihoods. This pandemic is not only claiming people's lives, but it's also wreaking havoc on their livelihoods. As we fight, to slow down the rate of infection and strive to provide adequate care and treatment to the infected. It also incumbent for government to implement social and economic measures to safeguard the people's livelihoods. It was therefore heartening to see the increased allocation to vote three, vote four, and vote six during the provincial special adjustment budget delivered on the 23rd of July. Last month, there are the departments. These are the Department of Economic Development, Health, and Social Development, which are highly critical votes in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. But also, regrettably, the allocation to vote eight, the Department of Human Settlement, it decreases a whopping 598 million, which mostly relates to the directive from national government to reprioritize the 490 million from the Integrated Housing and Human Settlement Development Grant. This is concerning because housing is a highly densely populated region. The latest geospatial map indicates that half of Houghton's 15 million people live on 2% of, of the land in the province. Therefore, the National Department of uh, Human Settlement has proposed the densification is a potential way to combat COVID-19, especially in informal settlements, where preventative hygiene and social distancing are particularly challenging to implement. In view of this national de-densification de imperative, the common sense expectation will have to be to see increased funding for the provision of additional housing units. These are some of the issues which we hope today's engagement 
uh, will clarify and also assist the committee to have an informed view on the province COVID response plan. I think also as a committee colleagues, uh, we want to also express our disappointment and anger over the reports of this widespread corruption involving funds meant for to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic across the province. I think this is the matter that must make all of us sick colleagues. Our country, you all recall that it had to borrow money from the IMF to deal with this crisis. Yet, for the ruthless COVID premiers and those within the state who enable corruption, this is simply to them an opportunity to exploit the situation. As colleagues, we are all concerned about these people who are unshamed about stealing money meant for protective gears and for nurses and doctors, for food parcels, for the poor, for the workers who find themselves unemployed, and for hospitals which requires beds and ventilators. So we are all in agreement that these monies are meant for the communities in desperate need of services. Unfortunately, others have seen an opportunity, but we should then commend the Premier for taking action in relation to this. It's a matter that we still feel, uh, uh, as we, we deliberate today, you'll update us on this matter. With these few words, I will hand over to you, uh, uh, MEC Lisufi, to introduce the team and lead us on the presentation. Today we'll be dealing with the reports for education, uh, health, and social development. Tomorrow's meeting will be about COCTA and the uh, human settlement. Over to you, uh, MEC Lesufi. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, truly appreciate the opportunity. I think let me start firstly by apologizing on behalf of our Premier. Our Premier, you might be aware, it's, it's public knowledge that he tested positive for COVID, but he has since recovered. But uh, due to some advices that he's receiving from the medical team, uh, he has been requested to take it easy uh, and has been doing that for quite some time. And one has been asked to step in. Uh, to assist. So I would like to apologize on behalf of our Premier. Um, our delegation is led by MEC Maile, but unfortunately also has to write uh, an agent paper in terms of his academic studies. Uh, he has requested that he be excused, but he'll be in a position to join the team uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, if possible, Chair. And I want to extend that apology. I'm joined by the acting MEC responsible for health in our province, uh, Ndate Jacob Mamabulo, uh, as well as uh, the MEC responsible for social development, uh, Dr. Mukheti. Uh, that's our delegation thus far. If there are other people that join, uh, I'll be in a position to introduce them later on. Thank you so much, Chair. Oh, my name is Panyazali Sufiyamu. I'm the MEC for Education in Gauteng. Thanks, Chair. Jefferson, where are you? Seems like he's frozen. <laughs> Where's Peggy? I don't know where he is. And please don't ask me to tell him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, take it over, Peggy. We can't be careless. No, is, is the chairperson struggling with, with, with conne connection? I see. His, what, uh, what's wrong? What's exactly. wrong with the chairperson? What's wrong with the chairperson? No, the, the, 
Uh, the MEC has handed over to you, but you are not responding, Chair. I went to the bathroom. Proceed. <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Chair. I, I forgot oh, also oh, to oh, introduce. Oh, oh. Sorry, Chair. I also uh, didn't introduce the DG of our province, uh, uh, DG Balin as well, Pindile Balin. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I said then once you, you finish the present the, the introduction, you're gonna deal with the presentation. Oh thanks. If it can be loaded. That's uh, what I said. That's why I even visited this bathroom. Apologies, Chair. Uh, apologies. Okay, proceed. Proceed. Uh, if, if the presentation can be loaded, uh, there are three areas that we will want to tackle today if possible. That will be education, health, and social development. Uh, the human settlement and factor component. That's the one that uh, MEC might is going to deal with it uh, when it's available. Uh, so we can start with the education, and I'll ask MEC Mama Ulo to deal with the health part, and uh, Dr. Mukhet is going to deal with the social development component of it. This is the education report, uh, honorable members. <clears throat> I'm going to move with lightning speed if possible, but where you feel that I'm moving uh, with unnecessary speed, please feel free to caution me and if needs be, guide me. Um, in Gauteng, as a Department of Education, we are influenced by a mantra that says safety first, that in everything that we do, we must consider uh, PPE is to be in the schools first before any school can operate, but most importantly, there must be screening of every individual that enters the school in premises, from workers, educators, learners, and those that are visiting our schools. And we must ensure that at all times there is social distancing, that schools must be cleaned frequently, and we deliberately use the word frequently so that it can accommodate any time where we sense that there is an urgent need for us to clean our schools, that there must be continuous supply of water, and that all our toilets in all our facilities must be in working order. And if schools become unsafe, well, we've taken a conscious decision that we'll close those schools immediately and retreat so that we can clean and reopen the schools. This is very important uh, so that all of us can understand the importance when we give you figures of the schools that have closed so that you are not shocked because it's this mantra of safety first. We've also given all our institutions what you call the prevention toolbox, but daily they must tick the box on the following matters, whether in the institutions there's social distancing, whether in the institution everyone is wearing an appropriate a PPE, that in each and every institution we are, we are in a position to determine symptoms, and that there is hand hygiene practice, and that everyone is uh, hand washing or sanitizing, and if needs be, there is a testing isolation for those that we suspect that they might be positive. So this is a toolkit that each and every school, every morning before they start the academic day, they must go through this process so that we are quite aware that everything is in order. We want to give you the attendance of learners. I think we've got it until the 3rd of August, if I'm not mistaken. But let's start with earlier on when the schools were opened uh, for the first time. Out of the 2,131 schools that we have in Gauteng, uh, of the 2,131 schools that we have in Gauteng, 2,026 schools reopened. We only have 218 schools that were closed. Majority of the schools that were closed, that is the 218, it was temporary closure on the basis that they needed to be decontaminated due to the reported COVID cases. There are others that are related to infrastructure. You will see later on in the presentation uh, that will take you through those schools that were vandalized, those that were broken in, and those schools that we felt that need to be need to be closed purely because there was a lack or uh, unavailability of water or electricity because uh, ESCOM is either uh, practicing what is called uh, load shading or load reduction. 
In terms of uh, schools that are taking care of learners with special needs, that is our Elson schools, we, all, we only have 19 schools that were closed. Uh, that is, uh, we have uh, 129 schools in total and 110 were open, but 19 were closed. This is mainly because uh, the PPEs for this particular sector, uh, it's a very difficult uh, specialized PPEs that are needed. So we're waiting for those PPEs, but we can confirm now those PPEs have since arrived and the problem have, have, have resolved. In terms of independent schools, these are schools that we are funding as government, but they run as private schools. That is, they've got a uh, half portion that is funded by parents, and another portion is funded by government. Of the 713 schools that we have, 607 were operational, only 46 were closed. The reason why the 46 were closed, they indicated to us that it didn't make uh, economic sense to open for other grades that can only when we open for bigger grades that they can operate because of the number of teachers that we have. Prior to the president announcing that we should uh, close schools, we had a series of disruptions in Gauti, and literally in each and every township. We had members of COSAS, members of SANCO, Y uh, Young Communist League, and various uh, parents' organizations uh, disrupting schooling in Gauti and claiming that we're risking the lives of children. And on that basis, uh, some of our schools were disrupted. You can move to the next slide. This is the average attendance uh, that uh, you, 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 we've recorded since the schools reopened. You can see the grade R, uh, we are worst affected. Uh, of the 16th of July, an average attendance of grade R was at 23%. By the 24th of July, it went down to 22%. Uh, grade 6, uh, it was at 53%, and it went down 50, 51% by the 24th of July. Grade 7, it was at 58 percent, it went down to 55 percent. Grade 11, it was at 61 percent, it went down to 50 percent. And grade 12, so we're at 70 percent attendance, it went down to 65 percent. And that is very worrying. It simply means that 35 percent of grade 12s are not attending school in Gauteng. And we are trying very hard to establish the reason and also to check whether we can't find them and bring them within the schooling environment. They can be online because in Gauteng, you have to register to do online learning. You have to register to do homeschooling. And we'll share with you the figures of online and uh, and those that are, are, are doing homeschooling. It doesn't tally. It doesn't bring the, the 35 odd percent that we needed to have 100 percent grade 12. So it's a cause for concern, but we're putting some intervention mechanisms there. Uh, to take the grade 12 to a permanent camp until the right examination so that we can deal with the challenges of attendance. If you go to educators, uh, it is, is more or less the same, uh, uh, but it's a, it's a serious cause for concern. And the reasons are there. We'll share with you why uh, with this number of educators that are not coming to work with grade R, uh, we're at 69 percent, to went down to 64 percent. Attendance of educators uh, with uh, grade six, uh, it, it went down from 71 percent to 65 percent. With grade seven, it went down from 75 percent to 66 percent. With grade 11, it went down from 74 percent to 68 percent. And with the matriculants, it also went down from 76 to 71 percent. This we will explain, at least we have an idea why uh, uh, this number of educators are not reporting for duty. We've got information that we'll share with you later on. Uh, when we take an average attendance uh, between the period of the 8th to the 24th of July, that is before learners went for the break, uh, you can see all the curves are going downwards, uh, indicating that the attendance uh, it's not satisfactory. So we've been below 70% averagely uh, at all levels. And uh, it's something that uh, we're working very, very hard because we've invested a lot of resources uh, on getting extra classroom, of getting PPEs, and of ensuring that the school nutrition is available. So this number of attendants uh, may affect the investment that we've made in this regard. We can move to the next slide. If we can move to the next slide, I'll be excited.
unless it's my slide that uh, okay thanks thank you so much uh, this 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 is the same recording uh, of teacher attendance and you can see that they themselves have never reached the 80 percent we've been hovering just below 80 percent uh, as i said at least this one we have an explanation because we've got figures of teachers that have made an application to retire to work from home and those that uh, have indicated that they've got core mobilities and they want uh, to work from home. So we will share that information with you. We can move to the next slide. This the these are the numbers of learners that have applied to study from home. Um, you can see that uh, the total number of applications that we received are 790 learners. Uh, of the 790 learners that applied to study at home, uh, 446 were male and 344 were female. Uh, and as a department, uh, we've got 192 applications that are still pending that we need to approve. Uh, for the first quarter, we've approved additional 31. Uh, we've registered 674 sites where learners attend uh, because they don't want to go to a school, they want to go to home education center. So we only have 790 learners that have made the application to study from home from February until July 2020. So you can see we still have a large chunk of learners that we don't know where they are and they've not shown up in even some of our online platform. We can go to the next slide. This is the registration of learners who were registered with the school first, but when we had the lockdown, their parents chose to keep them at home. Uh, we keep those statistics because they're very important for us so that we know where our learners. So we received 1,325 applications. Of the 1,325 applications, we have uh, approved 300. Uh, we have approved 219, and there are 300 that are, 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 are awaiting approval and those that are in the process of being approved by schools are 806. What basically happens now, so that we can have clarification, we've got three forms of schooling in Fauti. The first form of schooling is the face-to-face -face one that I've shared the figures of attendance. The second one is what we call uh, uh, homeschooling, that is parents are the ones that are teaching the children. And the last one is lockdown education, which is the one that I've just shared, where learners are registered with the schools, but they are learning from home. Uh, like uh, elderly people uh, working from home. So those are the three forms of education that we are supporting in Gauti. We want to take you through the COVID cases that we have. If you check the graph uh, that we are sharing with you, you can see that the graph was galloping. Uh, it was widening instead of flattening. Uh, it's an indication of what is happening in society generally. Uh, it's an indication of what was happening in Gauti. So you can see uh, that the numbers were increasing. Um, especially from uh, middle June, uh, from the 16th of June, we started to see that camp uh, going uh, quite high. Uh, and therefore, uh, we had lots and lots of positive cases within our school system. I will take you through the numbers in terms of learners, in terms of educators, in terms of our staff members, so that you can have an idea of the positive cases that we've reported in Gaudi. So we can move to the next slide. These are the figures as, as promised. Uh, we've categorized them in terms of region. Uh, that is Ekurulene, Tswane, Western, Johannesburg, and City Bay. Uh, those are the regions that uh, we've categorized them. And we've also made it easier in terms of the district so that you can know if we say Ekurulene North EN, uh, where is that district? Uh, Ekurulene North, it's uh, where I come from, Tembisa. Noni, Captain Park, and those areas. So there we have 105 affected schools. Uh, we had 105 affected schools. Affected means they reported cases uh, uh, of COVID. Um, if you take the total number of schools that reported cases of COVID, it's 1,776. That is out of 2,300 schools. Uh, that we have in Gauti. So out of the 2,300 schools that we have in Gauti, uh, almost uh, 1,776 schools uh, reported cases of COVID. In terms of learners that tested positive, we had 615 learners out of the 2.3 million learners that we have in Gauti. 
we've got 2.3 million uh, learners in Gauteng and 615 tested positive. Out of almost 60,000 educators that we have, 1,487 educators tested positive. Uh, in terms of their staff members, we've got 133 staff members of almost uh, 28,000 staff members that are not teaching. That is, these are our non-teaching staff members. Those that are working at offices and those that are working at districts, head office, and in some of our schools, but they are not teachers. So out of that number, it's only 133 that tested positive. In terms of our general assistant, we've got 55 uh, assistants that tested positive. We've got 2,300 youth brigades that uh, we've appointed to screen learners. Out of uh, to those 2,300 odds, we've got 19 that tested positive. The general assistant and the COVID youth brigades are a worrying factor because this is the first line of defense. Everyone that arrives at our schools must go through them. Uh, and that's the reason why we are monitoring those figures. So in total, uh, honorable members, we had 2,278 cases uh, that were reported within the schooling environment. Uh, as I'm speaking to you now, we've got currently we've got 218 schools that were closed. Uh, they were closed because they were waiting uh, to be decontaminated. Uh, it's 218 schools. I'll rush the curriculum delivery, teaching and learning. It's just to give you a high level understanding of the current, the kind of support and teaching that we're giving to our learners. Uh, but let's start with the phases that came in. We started with grade seven on the 8th of June and grade 12 as well. And then we accommodated grade six and grade 11 on the 6th of July. And on the 20th of July, we accommodated grade three and grade 10. So grade seven, six, three at primary schools, grade 12, 11, and 10 in Gaudi, those grades were accommodated before the president made an announcement uh, of the of the break. So subsequently, uh, the other grades that needed to come on, we could not bring them. Uh, so the other grades, that's grade one, two, four, five at primary school, nine and eight at high school. There is a new gazette that was introduced by the minister. Uh, these grades will be phased in from the 24th of August. So. But all other six grades, uh, we've managed to uh, phase them in, including grade R. Um, so, so that, so let's take you through the academic support that we are giving to these learners, so that we have a clear picture if learners are missing lessons or not. Let's go to the next grade, the next slide. Yeah. What we've done, uh, there's something that is called ATPs. Uh, if you can go back to the previous slide. Uh, there's something called ATPs. ATP is our annual teaching plan. So every year, the Department of Basic Education at head office give teachers their annual teaching plans, which means they are giving what they need to teach for that year. So that's the mandate of the National Department, so that there is one curriculum for the country. Um, so this year, because of COVID, uh, it was practically impossible uh, to, to, to follow the annual teaching plan. So they needed to be uh, trimmed uh, so that things that are not important can be isolated, so that you don't feed learners too much like they are robots. Uh, so you, you, you just pick up what is very important that will allow them to move to the next grade. And in that next grade, you will then populate the part that was not provided in the previous grade. So that is very, very important. So from grade one to grade nine, uh, those uh, 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 annual teaching plans were revised, mediated, and uh, there were pre PowerPoint presentations that were given to our teachers. Uh, this came in various forms. It came in USBs or CDs where people prefer CDs. It came in terms of exemplar lesson plans for teachers, exemplar PowerPoints, and exemplar worksheets. So our educators were given the material that they need to teach for this year. Uh, for the learners that are in grade one up to grade nine. This is very important because there is this element of pass one, pass all, or the, this element that we are overfeeding our children to finish the curriculum, or there is this argument uh, that they educate, they, they, the year has been lost, so these learners must just stay at home and not be taught. But the revised annual teaching plans give us an understanding of what learners in South Africa have been taught. And this is very, very important. So 
I felt I need to spend some few minutes on it because it's a very important uh, aspect of our education. Because we are the Department of Education, we are imparting knowledge. That's our mandate. We are not a department of PPEs or availability of toilets and other things. Our core mandate is education, and therefore that aspect needs to be met. We are also giving you a summary of what we call school-based assessment. These are the test, uh, examination, classwork that learners have written. Um, so that in case they can't write exams, we have a fallback. We have something that we can assess them. Uh, you can see where it's green, it means the performance is encouraging. Uh, where it's amber, it means we need to do some additional work. And where it's red, it means the learners are struggling. And you will see uh, that majority of the subjects that learners uh, are struggling with are those uh, subjects that uh, we are told are difficult. Uh, we are maths, not the maths with a SNA, not uh, uh, that maths uh, with a SNA. This is a full maths. Uh, you can see we've got uh, two of our districts that are struggling uh, with, uh, with maths uh, and also the social sciences, you can see an EMS. Uh, you've got lots and lots of uh, areas where uh, our learners are subject. This is very important because in case the curriculum comes to an end or the year comes to an end, uh, God forbid, uh, we are therefore going to use this school-based assessment uh, as a way of determining the, the, the capability uh, and the learning areas that our grade sevens uh, have acquired. So this information was correct as of the 24th of July. So I think that we might have moved uh, substantially in those ones. So the next slides are just is the same information, but about other grades. So you can move uh, uh, to the next slides, uh, if possible. Can we move the slides? In terms of grade 12, we are also giving you a summary of all our districts where they are uh, in terms of syllabus coverage, because we are monitoring this. It's a very, let's go back to the previous slides. It's a very important aspect so that each and every district, we can monitor and tell you whether this district is struggling or this district is not struggling. So you can see, uh, and I hope chairperson are not going to say I'm picking up your language, you can see Chevenda, first additional language. Majority of our learners are struggling with it, uh, uh, and, and both Chevenda as a home language. You'll see as well, as we move to the next slides, that there are other subjects that uh, we are struggling. Gauteng is the only province that have all the languages. We don't have the benefit of other provinces. For example, uh, in KZN, you'll mainly get uh, uh, Isuzulu, English and Afrikaans, where possible, course are there and there. In Free State, you'll find Sesotho, English and Africans. In the Eastern Cape, you'll find Sposa, English and Africans. But in Gaudi, we've got all languages, including uh, 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 Seswati. Uh, so, so, so we monitor that purely because if you fail a language, you fail the grade. So if you can't provide support for our learners, uh, for languages, uh, yeah, you will see that our learners will struggle. So it's very, very important that we monitor their performance. I've shared with you the revised annual teaching plan, so I'm not going to uh, spend more time on this particular slide. It just emphasizes the work that we have done, and we want to thank the National Department for providing these guidelines. It's a very, very important aspect. These are the emerging trends that we've picked up. Uh, what are the things that teachers are complaining about? Uh, teachers are complaining about time lost. Uh, learners are also struggling with concentration. They really believe that the schooling environment is so concentrated now. They have to worry about social distancing. They have to worry about many other things. And this is bringing some psychological impact on learners. And also there are capacity constraints uh, within our teachers. And teachers are extremely exhausted. And we thought that the break that we've given them will make them to come back re-energized. And some of our teachers, actual majority of our teachers, also have comorbidities. Uh, but to us, we are taking it as an opportunity uh, to replenish the teaching uh, uh, profession or, uh, by bringing young, dynamic people uh, so that uh, we don't have a teaching profession that is uh, heavily loaded uh, with people that are old, even though 
we vary the experience, but I think there's an opportunity for us uh, to bring young, dynamic people to the profession as well. Can we move to the next slide? Uh, this is the support that we are giving to learners. What happens is that all learners that are at home and they don't have computers or they can't learn, uh, and they can't learn from your online platforms, we give them a 14-day cycle work. So their parents or learners come to the school, they take work for 14 days. It includes tests, it includes assignments, it includes homeworks and all these things. And after 14 days, they bring that work and we give them a new work for 14 days while we are marking the assignments. That is why we can give you figures of learners that have passed or learners that have difficulties with various subjects. So every 14 days, especially those grades that have not reopened or they've not come back. So they're not sitting at home doing nothing. Uh, we are doing uh, what we call the learning activity packs. Every 14 days, uh, we give learners that work and they, they bring it back and teachers can also make assessment and determine. This is the area where we want to deploy those teachers with comorbidities that say they can't work. So that they can't stay at home doing nothing. Uh, they have to do this 14 work of marking scripts, doing uh, following homeworks of learners and other things, so that uh, we have teachers that are at school teaching not disrupted by those that are, are, are at home. We can move to the next slide. These are areas where learners can get the content uh, which is available. Uh, this is additional content. The majority of this content is zero-based, so that even those that don't have airtime, uh, they can they can get this kind of work. This is the work that we've done as a department on our own, uh, and this is the material that is owned by the department. It's not owned uh, by somebody. It's owned by the department and can be uh, uh, utilized by both parents and learners. Uh, in some instances, we've partnered with various companies. Can you go to the next slide? There's the additional support as well that uh, we are providing uh, so that uh, learners that are at home can also be in a position to access some of the work uh, that we are giving. This is to demonstrate to honorable members that even those learners that are coming from poor backgrounds, they're not missing out, uh, that we are putting additional support for them uh, so that it must not be those that have resources or their parents have laptops that they can connect uh, to learn, but we need to give support uh, to learners that also don't have access to, uh, to those tools or those devices. So it's just to give you a, 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 a highlight and an understanding of what we are providing. So I don't want to bore you. If possible, you can move as fast as possible. Also, our special schools, this is very, very important to us because learners with special needs are the ones that need support more than any other person. So they must not be treated like second-class citizens or third-class citizens. Actually, these are special learners that must be given all the support. So we are demonstrating to you uh, the support that we are giving uh, to all forms of learners uh, so that no one is left out on the basis of their disability. We can move to the next slide. These are the dates that, uh, we've, 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 or the, the, the information that we have provided for you to have an understanding uh, of learners uh, with special needs. Uh, currently, there are 4,945 learners that are enrolled at 124 schools that we have in Gauteng. There are 9,000 learners that are expected not to return uh, immediately because of underlining uh, diseases or sicknesses that they have. And there are 2,178 learners that are expected not to return as well uh, because parents feel that uh, it's not safe for learners to come back. So. We've given you the break, the big, with the breakdown of the entire sector, so that you can have an idea uh, the the size of this particular sector. You can move to the next slide. This is the additional work that we've given to them as well. Uh, we 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 really want to ensure that we comply and we give them all the relevant support that is needed. Um, but you can see that some schools that could not reopen because either. They were not part of the grades that the minister said they must come back or were waiting for PPEs or there was one form of vandalism or another. So we can move to the next slide. I said to members, feel free to stop me if you feel that I'm moving faster. This slide is very important. It paints the picture of the 
future of our educators. So those educators in Gauteng that are above 60, that want to leave the profession, there are 3,699. These are teachers saying, we've reached our uh, retirement age. We really believe that we can leave the sector now. But we have to manage that because they can't just leave at once. Uh, because if they leave at once, they will collapse the entire sector. You can see that of the 3,699 educators, 2,117 are teaching primary, are teaching at primary schools at primary level, and 1,193 are teaching at secondary level, whereas 389 are teaching at special schools. So we have to manage how we release them. Uh, so in total, uh, they, they, we, we have additional, I just want to be sure, we have additional 4,399 teachers that have comorbidities. That is, they've got underlying diseases uh, that they feel that they can't make themselves available. And if you combine those that have uh, uh, are reaching the age of 60, the 3,699, and those that want to leave because they've got comorbidities, you can see that the entire education sector can be paralyzed if this process is not managed carefully. Uh, and that is why it's within that context uh, that thus far, we've only, up, of, of, of the 3,617 uh, so 3,846 that have comorbidities were only approved 1,360 because the rest we want to satisfy ourselves that there's no abuse uh, that people want to leave because you have to recruit almost uh, 6,747 new teachers and that's a lot which simply means that you will have double parking, double pay because you'll pay new teachers on a post of somebody that is sitting at home, not teaching. So our human resource budget will then start to, uh, 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 to suffer. So we need to manage this process carefully. That is why you'll find doctors are involved, and that is why you'll find that the principals are involved, in ensuring that this process is done carefully. If it's not done carefully, it may collapse the state uh, in terms of budget, but may also collapse the education system in terms of the non-availability of educators. So this is a very important slide, and uh, it's very uh, we, we monitor it every week uh, because uh, of, of the consequences that the state might face if this process is not managed adequately. We can move to the next slide. This is the number of people that have applied to work from home. Uh, in total, we received 4,399 applications. Uh, from uh, um, staff members that want to work from home. Uh, we've only approved 1,567. And the reason we have approved fewer is because to work from home, you need devices, you need data. But there are areas where even if you want to work from home, you work as a team. Let's, let's take example examinations. If you have to mark an examination script, you have someone must mark it and someone must check it whether you have marked it correctly. But if someone is in Balfour Park and someone is in Soweto, uh, it makes things difficult. So we are checking those things uh, so that when we give approval, we give approval to people that are not going to disrupt the system, uh, but they're going to enhance the system. So of the 4,399, we've only approved 1,567. We can move to the next slide. And we've, we've, we've made these rulings. So there's no automatic provision of substitute for all those that want to work from home. Uh, there must be a process, and that process must be uh, 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 properly adjudicated, and there must be uh, uh, systems to check whether there's no abuse. Because if you don't do that, uh, you'll have something called multi-grading of classes or small schools or we'll have classrooms that don't have teachers. So we, we have to be very, very careful with this process. We can move to the next slide. Let's move to the next slide. Yeah, this important element, uh, when we reopen schools, 
as I've indicated, out of the 2,300 schools that we have in Gauteng, 67 schools could not start uh, because there was uh, no water or less pressure in terms of water. Uh, we are happy to report that that problem has been resolved. So we don't have a single school in Gauteng that does not have water. But what we have, we have a problem of load reduction. Uh, when you have a load reduction, when electri electricity switch off, because some of the water pumps use electricity, you find that we have problems of, 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 of water being available. But uh, in terms of water supply, the 67 schools that were identified, the bottom 67 schools that were identified that they didn't have water, they now have water. But the schools that are experiencing, because the big schools that are experiencing uh, space challenges, uh, that, as I said, we are 2,207 schools that have opened since 8 February. Uh, but there are some schools that have uh, uh, challenges, and there are schools that we felt that we need to give them additional mobile classes. There are 103 schools that we did that, purely because there was theft, arson, butlerism, and vandalism. You'll see vandalism is a common denominator in our schools in Kauti. There are lots and lots of people that are vandalizing our schools. What for? We don't even know. We can move to the next slide. Here we're giving progress of the schools that didn't open uh, and the challenges that they have. You can see in Ekurulene at Pumla Gardens, we had problems of vandalism and the water pipes were removed and the school ablution facilities were in a bad state. But as of the 12th of June, the entire uh, problem was resolved. Uh, and we list all those schools that had problems. So I don't want to bore you. Uh, what is very important is that where there were these problems. Uh, these problems have since been resolved. We can move to the next slide. So we want to confirm that uh, we had 351 schools that were vandalized. We have appointed 351 contractors. And of the 351 schools that were vandalized, 89 are now complete but there are others that you are still uh, uh, attending to the problems, but the holidays that we had now assisted us to conclude uh, that aspect. There were six schools that were bent down completely. Uh, of the six schools, we've given them three mobile classrooms so that it can serve it as an administrative block. Of the six schools that were bent down, the areas that were targeted were mainly the administrative block. We're giving you a breakdown of the repairs progress thus far of the schools that we vandalized. So of the 351 schools that we vandalized, we are now averagely at 38%, I think. But now, because schools were closed, I can assure you we are hovering around 60, 65% now uh, in concluding the work that was done. We've indicated that we have mitigated space at 103 schools. And there are six new schools that uh, went uh, is, are going under construction, uh, but it's very difficult now uh, because of COVID-related regulations. But we've got six new schools uh, that we are building, and we also have schools uh, that we are using alternative construction technology (ACT) uh, for Grade R, so that we can uh, assist the Grade Rs in terms of social distancing. Let's move to the next slide. Because of the disruptions that we had, because these disruptions are the ones that are making learners not to feel safe to come to school. You will recall at the beginning I shared with you uh, the number of learners that are not coming to school. We have now partnered with the, the, the Army uh, to assist us on three key areas. Uh, the first one is to, because we have two lab, we have two youth brigades that screen learners. If you have a school that they have, say, 1,000 uh, learners in the morning, uh, and they have to go through only two people to screen them, uh, it causes delay and normally affects the morning classes. So we have requested the Army to assist us with mass screening, but also requested the Army to assist us with uh, regular disinfection, because uh, uh, you, you, you've seen we've got almost 210 schools that they closed because they are waiting disinfection. And the Department of Health does not have that capacity. So the Army has agreed to assist us uh, to disinfect, mask screening, but also 
to be standby to protect schools for those that want to disrupt schools, uh, the COSASs and uh, SGBs that want to uh, disrupt schools. And we're very grateful to them that they've agreed to work with us. So we're giving them additional support in terms of buying the PPEs, uh, the, the equipment they need to disinfect. Uh, but uh, they are not within the school premises. They just stand by closer to schools to ensure that schools are not protected. We really believe that if we can up this kind of support, majority of learners will start to come back to school because uh, there were lots and lots of schools that were disrupted by various organizations. And we are sharing with you the terms of engagement with the army uh, uh, so that uh, we might not be accused that we are using the army to skid and donor. Uh, they are just there to protect and to provide the support that we need. We can move to the next slide. This one is a very difficult one, I must say. Uh, we as a province, uh, we, we, we wanted to provide school nutrition during lockdown, but unfortunately, uh, because there's a conditional grant, you needed to get the national department to approve, uh, and we had challenges to get that approval. Uh, in the ultimate end, you are quite aware that the national department was taken to court, and the court uh, instructed that we must feed learners. So we are putting the systems to do that because majority of learners are at home. So uh, what we have done as a department, we are now send a message through parents and learners, community radio stations, that those that need to continue to get the food at our schools, they must feel free to come uh, or go to the nearest school. They don't have to go to a school that they normally attend if they're using scholar transport. They must just go to the nearest school where their PPEs bring their containers of collecting food and will be in a position to provide that. Thus far, we are providing support to close to 1.1 million learners that are using uh, this facility. But it's a very, very difficult uh, aspect because uh, you don't know who will come when, so you don't even know uh, the portion that you need to prepare. Uh, but under these difficult circumstances, uh, we're just thrilled that we are indeed feeding our learners. The second one that's a difficult one is the scholar transport. What happens here is that with the scholar transport, the transport providers, they say it's not their baby. It was not their baby that the government, the government took a decision that we bring in, for example, in high school, only two grades. So they have a contract with government, with the department to ferry learners. So because they invoice per learner, not per, 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 per load, they are now claiming that they must, we, government must pay for the empty seats uh, that are there. Uh, and and we, we are trying to get uh, the proper legal advice uh, on that. But majority of scholar transport service providers are no longer transporting our learners. Uh, it's a major risk. So. We are working very hard to remedy this risk. Yeah, they say pay us as per the contract we've signed with you. Don't tell us about COVID. Don't tell us that you've got only fewer learners that are coming to school. We we signed the contract of all learners and therefore pay us for that. So it's one area that uh, we are working on. But all other things, uh, they are still intact. We can move to the next slide. This is the kind of psychosocial support we're giving to learners and educators. You might be aware that there are learners that have comorbidities as well. So our team of social workers is providing support to educators, staff members, because you'll agree with me, uh, the COVID thing is really affecting the psychological standing uh, uh, of, 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 of um, our, our learners, our educators, and our staff members. Uh, but this slide is just to confirm that we're providing that kind of support. Next slide. It's the same information that we shared with you, uh, that we had a break in education. You're quite aware the president made that announcement. And now that uh, the president has made an announcement, the matriculants are now back. We're expecting the grade sevens to be back next week. On that basis. Lusufi? MEC Lusufi? Yes, Chairperson. wrapping up, please, please. Thank you. I that's know the, you it, can talk the whole evening. <laughs> that's the indication I was looking for, Chair. Uh, let's do the, the last three slides. I think will be done. 
Uh, this is the, the proposed dates that we are proposing in Gauteng of the learners to come back. We, we can't take all of them, so we want to bring uh, uh, the grade fours and fives, and then one later on to bring the grade one and twos, uh, and as well as the grade eight, we really believe will be done. And this is how we're going to distribute uh, the, the PPEs for them so that they can be safe. Uh, and there is a national revised uh, the calendar now that DBE has uh, released. Uh, we're working around this thing. Uh, I want to leave it here, Chair, uh, just to indicate that we are ready now to bring the learners that are coming back. But we felt we need to be detailed so that we can have an, I have an idea that we've covered all the corners and all the areas and that we're providing additional support to our learners, to our educators and our staff members. Unfortunately, We've lost lots and lots of educators uh, through COVID, and we've also lost uh, some learners in terms of COVID, and we've also lost senior managers of the department uh, through uh, COVID. And we hopefully we are doing this in their spirit and where they are, uh, they will really uh, rest in peace. Thanks so much, Chair, and apologies for taking that long. We can now take okay. uh, MEC. Mama Bolo to take us through the health component, if you don't mind. Thanks, Yes, Jeff. that's what is happening up there. Yes. Can we load the presentation that is going to be led by MEC Mama Bolo? The health presentation. Community section, are we loading it? MBC Mama Bolo, can I hand over to you? It's loaded. Yeah. Thank over you very you. much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, Honorable, uh, I mean, MEC the Sufi, and thanks for the opportunity. Without any waste of time, Chair, with your permission, and I really plead for your permission that I asked our HOD to lead us on the presentation, uh, HOD Lukele. Can I ask him oh. to take us through the, the presentation? HOD? HOD, please, HOD, look at it. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair. Good evening, uh, honorable members. Good evening, uh, MEC the uh, uh, and MEC uh, Mama Bolo. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, there are two presentations. One is to talk about the strategy and the other one, the current environment. One is an outline of uh, the strategy. Uh, maybe let's just go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as uh, as Gauteng uh, uh, province, uh, we we took the six pillar approach um, uh, uh, strategy, which is a comprehensive health, uh, supported by uh, 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 the food uh, 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 part, and also uh, uh, supported. Uh, uh, by uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, social uh, mobilization, and uh, uh, also uh, not forgetting the economical uh, uh, aspect. But in essence, that strategy uh, was to just establish a multisectorial coordination of teams of both provincial and district level for the COVID response, and to strengthen the capacity to uh, undertake surveillance of COVID-19 at provincial and district uh, level, and also uh, training of uh, teams of uh, contact tracers to ensure that uh, positive case contacts uh, can be uh, ex expeditiously uh, uh, located, tested, and quarantined. <coughs> and the uh, healthcare system is prepared to receive, and manage, and report on the cases. 
and also the designation of uh, initially at the beginning what we would have remembered that uh, three hospitals were identified uh, Charlotte Macheke, Steve Biko and uh, Tembisa that is when uh, we only had uh, the exported cases and that has since uh, changed and we learned some lessons through that next slide please <coughs> And uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, Chair, there seem to be some technical problems in the movement of the slide. I don't know if I'm still audible. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, HOD. If, uh, if, if I can be set on moving the slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Then uh, we, we, we had management uh, uh, structures, mainly the provincial uh, uh, command council, which is chaired by the premier and uh, 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 has have all the uh, provincial MECs uh, uh, and the directors uh, and uh, the police commissioner. Uh, that uh, structure meets twice a year week. Next slide, please. I'd like to move uh, fast on, on, on these uh, next two slides, if it's possible. So this while we're waiting should, for the next one. It should even this one have the PDM, this is the structures, we can move almost to get to the real things. Yes, uh, uh, if somebody can, can then move for us the slides. We are now on the operating model COVID-19 project. You want to say something? Yes, uh, uh, the slide. Yes, yes. Uh, this is just to show the other uh, 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 work streams which are involved, and the comprehensive health, uh, health stream is uh, uh, is the one above. Let's move. HOD, the slides have moved. Uh, uh, it's not visible on my side. Uh, yes, uh, I think we can move the uh, from this slide as well. It just talks about the lessons that learned. Uh, initially was experiential learning, then preparedness for the worst case scenario. And also, uh, we're looking at uh, building continuity and sustainability uh, because of our, our model. Can I go to slide number 12, please? This planning is part of the planning where it involves planning for the health crisis, but at the same time, planning for the economical uh, crisis. Uh, 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 let's go to the next slide. Slide number 12, which talks about scenario modeling. So in terms of the scenario modeling, we use the two scenarios, the one by the National Department of Health and also our same, and we estimated that at the peak, there will be about 400,000 people infected. Ours was even more. 
uh, that means that we needed about uh, 8,000 uh, to 11,000 uh, ICUs. General ward beds, 25,000. So we use this uh, estimate as a, as, as, as a, in, in planning for the beds, and we estimated that the peak would be in uh, uh, mid-August, uh, in early uh, September. And we happen to find that both national and provincial uh, uh, agreeing on that. Next slide. While we, we are there and going to the next slide, we had estimated that a number of the people who are infected will uh, be a, 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 a asymptomatic and a few uh, will be symptomatic. Of those who are symptomatic, we estimated that 85% uh, will have mild disease and uh, uh, only about 5% will, uh, 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 will uh, have a, a critical uh, disease needing ICU and high care and 10% needing uh, um, just general wards. Uh, next slide, please. Can we move to slide 14? My apologies, Chairperson uh, um, and members, uh, the screen seems to be frozen. Um, as we are waiting for the next slide, uh, uh, let me go to uh, our approach on the infrastructure. On the infrastructure, we you look at our current infrastructure, this, that is the current uh, 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 hospitals. And the first thing which we did was to look at the wards and repurpose those wards uh, 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 differently such that they can be able to uh, accommodate COVID patients, ensuring that there's oxygen support in the wards. Uh, that's where I am, yes. This is a very important uh, part in the, in, in the presentation. So we looked at our capacity and um, we then looked at um, uh, the planned beds and wards well, we repurposed uh, a, a number of our facilities that can go into details in the next slide. But then we then said that because of the number of beds which are needed, we needed more beds. We then opted to put alternative uh, building technology within our structures, which could be uh, uh, of, of use post-COVID. For instance, uh, at uh, Jubilee, uh, where uh, uh, the current hospital is old and, 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 and other hospitals. And having done that, when we calculated, we then thought we also need field hospitals uh, uh, informed by the models. And um, uh, looking at what we needed and calculated on the field hospitals, we then appreciated that there might be an instance where the, 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 the pandemic is, is very high, but that was the planning at, at uh, that stage already. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, while we're waiting for the slides to change, yes. So in this slide, what we did, it's a, it's a, it's a very busy slide, but in essence, we used the number of cases which were estimated that there will be 25,000 beds at the peak uh, uh, 8,000, uh, 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 25,000 will need uh, general wards, 8,000 will need high care, and 4,000 will need uh, uh, ICU. Then we said, what do we require? And then we analyzed where we are, and we said, uh, 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 what can we plan and the gaps? So that went first for the infrastructure. It then went uh, a second on the blue on the top for the medical technology also calculated on the human resource which will be needed. Uh, for instance, uh, we then said we would need uh, an additional 3,802 nurses. We will need an additional 91 doctors, etc. Uh, uh, and, and we calculated the bare, the gap plan for oxygen because we knew that this uh, condition uh, will need a lot of uh, oxygen. Also plan for other key uh, areas like this is just to share the 
planning which went through quite early in terms of the preparedness uh, for next slide please Uh, uh, next slide, please. I think uh, we'll have to then a number of slides uh, which uh, demonstrate uh, and uh, members uh, can, uh, can, can can look at. Uh, I would like to, uh, as soon as we are able to get, but I'd like to indicate that just on the progress of uh, reconstruction and doing the additional beds, we were able to increase the number of beds which were available for COVID to 2,418. And uh, then we then uh, added uh, uh, field hospitals, we all know about the readiness at Nazareth. Currently, uh, it, uh, 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 it had initially 500 beds, then had an additional 1,000. We plan to do an additional 1,000 beds there, and uh, we are also ensuring that as a, uh, a down report. Please, can you hear the DJ, the HOD? No, he has frozen, chair. No. Yes, because HOD, are you okay? Yeah, I thought it was only myself. No, it's not only you, Chair. Uh, we can't hear the HOD. MEC Mama Wolo is he supported by some of the colleagues who can take over because of, the, I think, it's his connection problems now. Nah? MEC Mama Wolo. Uh, can I just uh, check, uh, Chairperson, and then... Uh, can I just check and, and maybe we move to to the next item if he doesn't come in in the next three minutes, two okay. minutes? Let so me just can check. Can I ask yeah. the colleagues to have the comfort break for two minutes? Grab water, tea, while the ABC is checking on the HOD, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. A tea will do, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, it takes five minutes five to minutes. prepare. Five minutes, Thank five you so much. Minutes, you know. It's five. Yes, five. you said five. Mm. Alipi, you said five. Okay. Continue. 24 minutes. All right. Continue. Continue.
Okay, over to you, H.O.D. Lukele. Proceed. Uh, it seems as if colleagues, can we allow Mr. Malotena to proceed then? Anyone must proceed, Chair. Yes, it seems as if the HOD has got a problem. Uh, Mr. Malotena, proceed then. Eh? Take over. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I've just come back. I, I agree that. Uh, my connectivity is a problem this side. Um, mm. Mr. Malikani can just uh, take us through the next uh, presentation on uh, current uh, 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 this current situation. I just wanted yeah. to just show the members our plans. And uh, I think I was uh, done with this presentation. Uh, 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 they can just uh, load for us uh, the next uh, presentation. Uh, the next presentation, and can I plead with a uh, Mr. Malotan? Can you just take 15 minutes to wrap up everything? Ne? Thanks, Chair. I'll do. I'll do my best. Okay, it's fine. Chair, if you allow me, I'll start and, and I'm cognizant of time. I will try and quickly run through the presentation. Uh, thanks, Chair, committee members, MEC, DG, and colleagues. Uh, the, this slide the members will be familiar with. This is the national picture that the minister releases daily. This is just to show that the, the strength of the pandemic on a national basis. Safe to say that we, the national, we've conducted over 3 million tests with 521,000 uh, positive cases identified to date, with 363,000 recoveries having been identified uh, to date, and over certainly with 8,884 deaths and 4,445 new cases reported. I think noticeably for the members is that if you look at the trend, the 4,445 has been the lowest in a while uh, in the past uh, a couple of weeks. Um, it's safe to say Gauteng remains the epicenter with 183,000 cases, followed by the Western Cape with 97,000 cases, and KZN as the third. This is just uh, just to contextualize uh, globally uh, the Gauteng province with the size of the population, active cases, and daily rate of infection. Uh, there is uh, uh, some degree of, of, of reduction in terms of daily infection. Houghton to date registered 1,144 new cases, taking us to 183,000 active cases with 51,000 uh, 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 cases active, and of course, uh, 2,313 deaths reported. The slide here, just uh, if we can just slow down a bit. Uh, the, what is important for the members is to note that uh, Houghton has got three metros and 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 and, and two uh, district municipalities. Most of our cases are, are confined to the metros, and Johannesburg having the being the hardest hit. Uh, in terms of who in Houghton is affected the most by the by the pandemic, the males are slightly more uh, than the females, and of course the, the age distribution of the cases is uh, between the ages of 59 and 69, where the pandemic is felt the most. We can go to the next slide. And this next slide really just shows us where, in, the, in terms of the top 10 wards in the province, where the number of active cases per population uh, on, on the right side there just shows us that the Warnerborn, Anlen, Sinoville area is the highest currently, followed by the Marshall Town, Johannesburg, CBD to the south towards Kenilworth. And, and the, in terms of the sub-district, Johannesburg region, D, E, F, and E are the hardest hit in terms of number of active cases per sub-district. We can go to the next slide. The next slide just shows us the, the pandemic timeline, in meaning uh, where we are from the 8th of March uh, and, and to date in terms of the numbers. And I think we are still on the uprise, although the numbers recently has been a bit slower. So I'll, uh, I'll then stop and just give a high-level summary of what, what, the, the, what the presentation is about. Uh, the next slide just gives us the summary. New cases today, 
uh, that are reported 1,141. If you can go to the next slide, um, new cases, most of those cases are located to the metro. Johannesburg carries the, the most number of cases in, 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 in the province, followed by Kruleni and, and Tuani. Noticeably for us is the number of cases that are increasing uh, in City Bank. Of course, we are continuing to do our daily uh, um, uh, screening and testing. 109,390 people have been screened, and of course, uh, 1,865 tests will have been performed. In terms of what are the contributors to a number of deaths, um, the comorbidities of diabetes, uh, hypertension, and, and, and of course, a, a retroviral disease are the biggest contributors. You can go to the next slide. This is just to geographically show that uh, per, per metropole, Johannesburg has the highest number of, 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 of cases, over 70,000, but Johannesburg contributes most number of cases, recoveries, active cases, and number of deaths, uh, and of course, followed by Gruleni and, and so on in that order. We are, we are, we are put, keeping a close eye on Gruleni and Citibank recently, given the number of cases that they are having. Next slide. The next slide just shows the number of deaths that you are having in the province and where the, where the most deaths are. If we can move the slide, uh, those deaths are happening uh, within the age group of 50 to, uh, 50 to 79 are the most. And of course, if I said earlier that the males in the province are slightly harder to hit than the females, but noticeably is that the age group of, 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 of uh, 30 to 39 are also starting to feel a, a, a bit of a pinch. Uh, in terms of the number of deaths. As it relates to contact tracing in the province, we will have traced 88,236. And of course, contact that are being discharged that are no longer being monitored are 67,000 and, 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 and monitoring 21,106. And, and most of those active contacts that have been traced given the number of new cases are in Johannesburg and in the Western. Uh, uh, that's what the, that line is really indicating. In terms of screening and testing, if you go to the next slide, just because of time, we will have screened to date more than 12 million people, 948 uh, to date, and have tested three and have tested 300 and two, 300, 329, 554. If we can move the next slide, and 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 then in that slide, it also shows us the the the, the number of the work that is being done on daily basis. So if you can look on the 4th of August, you will see that 109. 1,390 people who have been screened, 1,865 people who have, who have been tested. Uh, uh, this is just in Gauteng, we, we've we added what we call a sixth region, uh, which district, which is correctional services. This just shows that the number, the type of work that has been done in correctional services in day, a day a daily to monitor the, the, the number of infections amongst the inmates, staff, and of course, in the presence, they are also what we, uh, they are mental health care users. They are monitors. In Gauteng alone today, we've got we've had only 15 deaths, and most of them are, are officials of the the correctional services. Only two of them uh, being uh, being of two of those deaths being inmates. The slides just shows that the quarantine sites that we have in Gauteng uniquely we've got number of quarantine sites that are managed by the province, and the others that are managed by nationally. Uh, and, and as this thing stands, we've got a bed occupancy of 25.7% bed occupancy. So meaning we've got 4,837 beds that we can take anybody anytime for quarantine purposes. So we see currently sitting with 1,670 uh, persons under investigation in our quarantine sites. And of course, with 179 of those uh, having tested positive. For the sake of time, uh, I'll, I'll then just move to the number of cases for case management. This will talk to a number, a number of patients that are in our facility. If you go to the next slide, it will show us that in terms of patients that are admitted to date, we've got 5,887. These are patients that are, are confirmed, um, uh, uh, patients that are confirmed positive. Bulk of them are almost 50-50 distributed between public and private, but safe, uh, what is reassuring that most of those patients are really in general wards and room A, uh, nothing intensive. Most of those that are being ventilated or require any intensive procedures, 302 of them are sitting in private hospitals. Uh, and so we still have a bit of capacity for the number of patients. In, so in terms of where we are uh, uh, and the admissions that we have. If we go to the next slide, it is just what is our electronic bed management system. 
that just shows you the dashboards that how we are monitoring the beds that we have in the province. This is a live system. So high level, it just says, it shows us that we have 3,020 beds that are COVID allocated currently that are, are, are allocated. Of those 2,545 of them are occupied, 546 of them are currently free. The distribution, 1,391 of them are sitting with COVID positive patient and 1,154 of those are sitting with PUIs. And the distribution at the bottom of the screen, they shows you where the patients are. There are Tom, Charlotte, Mata, Ketembisa, in the least being instead of from dealing with one patient. So this is just how we're managing, monitoring and, and controlling our bed management. So in terms of the death, uh, this is just a summary of those deaths where they've occurred, public inclusive of, of homes, 1,125, and the rest of the death will have occurred within some sort of healthcare institution, the 1,143, giving us a total of 2,268 today. Just the, the, the last few slides, it talks about the, the, the management of occupational health and safety and infection prevention and control. So this, are, uh, 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 this is relates to the staph infections. If you go to the next slide, just to show that as, as last reported, if you go to the next slide, what is not what to, to members to, to notice there is the number of infections that uh, GPG health workers have and those that are in the private health at last count, GPG at 2008, counting had 2,899 infected health workers, and the private had 2,643, and national departments that had 2,275, and the educators, the MEC for education made reference to their educators' infection and learner infections that they've had. And of course, in Houghton, we've got mines. There was a beginning in the beginning of May. We had uh, quite an increased number of infection, and they have since stabilized in terms of the infections that are happening on the mine. They seem to have plateaued. Something seems to be working. There. With the next slide, it will just present the same information differently, just to show that the highest number of infections here. Um, of course, our GPG, uh, our provincial staff workers, uh, 2,800, uh, uh, so the slide is more. But this is just a summary. But of course, in terms of the, this is the breakdown of health worker infection in Gauteng district per sector. We, we can see that we, we are almost equally distributed in terms of where the infections are happening and, and in terms of the, the category of the staff between uh, public and private, and of course the, the, the doctors versus nurses, and then of course lay counselors and others, because that's really the distribution of our health workers infection. There is an intensive uh, GPG uh, OHS that is coordinated at the office of the Premier that monitors the daily work in terms of the infections that are happening, uh, and, and, and then of course the municipal workers that get infected monitored and reported daily. So on a high level with the time allocated, I think this is just the gist to just give a sense of where we are in, in terms of how things report response to COVID as things stand. Uh, I yeah. want to stop here. This interview. Thanks, Chen. Thanks. Hey, who said the background talking? Uh, Mr. Anna. Can you mute your mic? It's you. Oh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can mute. It's okay. So those Comrade are Chair. the yes. Comrade, we also brought the MEC for social development just to give a brief report on the support we've given to the weak and the vulnerable during COVID. Yes, that's uh, what I wanted to do. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Uh, Dr. We locate a, a report is there on any of the provincial report? Where do we get it? It can be loaded. I know it was submitted. Sir. Okay, it's fine. Let's load it quickly and hand over to the MEC for social development. Colleagues, did you receive the report? Yes, 
Chairperson, I didn't receive any report from social development. That, that's we didn't. Point. That's, that's no, we point. didn't, Chair. We didn't get the social development one. I you must bring maybe. it. Okay, it's fine, Chair. If you don't mind, Chair, we can take questions on those two reports. So can we say to... social development will deal with it tomorrow when we deal with the uh, human settlement and cocktail? Eh? Can your advice is appreciated. Yes, your advice is appreciated. And can we make sure that that report is sent to us tonight? Because it's what we are missing on our part. We'll do so, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so that tomorrow then we'll be able to deal with human settlement, COCTA, and also social development. So those are the two presentations, colleagues. Uh, COVID response plan, uh, the health one, and the uh, education report. So can we strictly uh, deal with the ones that relates to the two? Then the, tomorrow we're going to deal with the one social development questions, if you have them, COCTA, and the, the other one is uh, human settlement, so, so that we can be focused, colleagues. Can I see a show of hands who want to interact with the presentations? Keza? Who else has that laser? Switch on your video. Hussein. Hussein. Operman. Mkalipi. Mkalipi. Operman. So. Yes. So. Is it the five of you? Hi, Tebe. With an H. Yes. Without age. <laughs> and who else? So thus far is the six of you. Keza, Hussein, Kalipi, Operman, Tohu, and Hade with an H. Can we start with Honorable Keza? Thank you, Chair. I will start with the... Uh presentation by the Department of Education. I have a few questions uh, with regards to uh, the method that they have used to appoint the, constru the, the construction companies who, who were to rebuild the vandalized schools. Uh, what is the process uh, that they have used uh, to, to appoint those, uh, those uh, companies because it was not clear in the presentation number two uh, with regards to the deployment of the army around schools uh, what lessons have the department learned from the uh, recent killing of mr collins causa uh, and if anyone gets killed around that place what psychological impact uh, will it have on children and, 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 and what should be the message to children uh, if there are soldiers around them while they are they are they should be focusing on on, 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 on school on school work uh, what would happen who will be held uh, responsible for if anything goes wrong uh, uh, through the deployment of the soldiers? Because I had hoped that uh, there was a a a a a a, 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 a court uh, a, a, a process that was that was uh, uh, led by by advocate Ngai Toby, where he says this that uh, the way the soldiers are socialized. Uh, uh, they are not given uh, responsibilities in terms of human rights. They ask is to neutralize the, the enemy, and the enemy in this case uh, being the people of South Africa, and and worse to find to find them around around school premises. It leaves a lot to be desired. What decision? What kind of decision that informed the deployment of soldiers, given the the the, 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 the recent uh, killings? 
that we have witnessed and the and the and the conduct of soldiers. Why would you would you would you would you send soldiers? Let alone metropolis, who are also implicated in 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 these uh, atrocities. So so I would like to know that uh, to so that you can explain to us uh, what 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 is that. Uh, uh, thirdly, I would like to ask. Uh, with regards to the, the reopening of schools, uh, MSC, uh, that uh, do you think that the re reopening of schools contributed to the safety of teachers, learners, and non-learners against the virus? And if 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 so, how so? If not, why are the schools uh, being 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 uh, 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 um, reopened and opened and so forth. Why, why, why are we continuing uh, like that without a scientific evidence that points at, uh, at, 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 at whether we are ready to open the schools, apart from the fact that you are giving us a, 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 a specific um, a, 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 a specific uh, mandate of the department. Uh, that that you 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 are dealing with with with, uh, with schools and so on, and the other questions that I the, the other question that I have with regards to education in the province is the fact that 60% in the country of teachers are female, yet 20% of of yet yet 20% are, are principals, of principals are women, right? Is patriarchy raising its ugly head in education? How many female teachers uh, are principals in your province? And what actions have you taken? Have you taken to change this situation? Uh, the other questions that I, that I have with regard to 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 the MSC, uh, or, or rather, uh, the fact that. Uh, uh, I will, I will, I will, I will move from the from education chair and go to uh, to the health department. Uh, the health, in terms of health presentation chair, uh, we have seen uh, 135 million tender uh, irregularity in Gauteng. How many companies uh, were found to have used the deviation and emergency clauses in law? to create emergencies where there have been no emergencies at all. So how many of them have done that? Uh, and, and what are the consequences in terms of their, uh, their, their salaries and pensions, the people that are implicated? Uh, what measures and the people that are officials, particularly who are working, who are, who are involved in your, in your health, in, in, in the health, uh, uh, department. What measures did the provincial Department of Health use prior to the allocation of the stimulus package to bring to deal with the corruption? And what consequences will you put in place for the officials what, that have been implicated in the lost uh, COVID-19 funds to the tune of 2.2 billion dodgy contracts in emergency spending? Is there a forensic investigation for the allegations against Tuo Rhodesia, owned by former minister Nomvulo Mukonyan's daughter Katek, and 102 companies being probed and, and, and on the looting oh, of 19. Why did the ANC, uh, M M M M MEC for Health went, went to inspect graves? He was seen on, 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 on social media inspecting graves there. Uh, I want to, 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 to understand uh, why, 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 why was he seen in graves now, as if he's the MSC for death, not that of health. Why? In terms of the capacity of the hospitals uh, to carry the load, are the hospitals able to carry the load of the affected uh, patients and and the, the the number of 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 nurses are the nurses the capacity is the capa is the capacity for for the nurses that are 
that are physical in terms of uh, 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 dealing with that. Uh, uh, in France, Fanon uh, called betrayal and broken promises as social treason. As social treason, uh, he calls us. He calls us to work towards new concepts, uh, where source are those who did not count, those who who were not recognized, and those who were who were outside the class system. Uh, he also says that once the hours of effusion and and enthusiasm before the, the spectacle of the national flag floating in the wind are past, the people rediscover the first dimension of the of of its requirement: bread, clothing, shelter, and 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 and, and of course dignity. So 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 we would like to know uh, uh, the people that uh, have been implicated uh, in terms of of of. Many of, of, of the monies that lo were lost in, in COVID-19 uh, in terms of uh, the emergency uh, uh, allocations. I, I will stop it. I will stop at that, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Keza. The next speaker on the line is Honorable Hussein. Chair, uh, thank you very much. I just have a few questions which I'm going to focus only on um, the Department of Health, if you don't mind, uh, which I find to be the more, more urgent one. And I, um, I I might build on some of the questions that uh, the previous uh, speaker had raised. Chairperson, you'll remember that uh, sometime in March, um, when the president first announced and uh, addressed uh, in South Africa, and he announced the lockdown, um, the main motivation for doing so was to make sure that our our health services have adequate time to be able to prepare uh, for the impact of COVID-19, as there has been a number of projections at the time of what the peak might look like. Now, um, I think since March already, there was an expectation on uh, the health departments in particular to ready themselves uh, for that peak, and I, I hear that the peak might happen in Gauteng sometime between September and October. But what troubles me about this report, and uh, may I just pause at that point to say, Chair, that uh, I appreciate the level of detail that has been provided by both of the, the departments. Um, it's, uh, it is refreshing to, the, to receive that level of fine detail, uh, and it does give a sense of confidence. So thank you very much. But, but um, on the same token, what it does, uh, providing that detail actually exposes uh, to some degree, just how far behind Gauteng is when it comes to its own readiness um, uh, for that peak. So I saw the one slide in particular about um, the number of hospital beds that are required and uh, some of the interventions that you're making to procure new beds and new hospitals. But from the face of it, uh, when you look at those presentations, I'm finding it very hard to believe that the province of Gauteng will be ready and adequately prepared when it gets to the peak. So if the department can maybe address that in a very direct question, and the question is simply this, can you give us the confidence that when you get to the peak, that you will have sufficient number of beds available, sufficient number of I, uh, ICU beds available, enough ventilators available, and the necessary personnel to be able to uh, address that uh, the challenge that you're going to, that you know that is coming very soon. And, you don't have much time from now. So, and maybe, you know, because that slide didn't give us, although it gave us the detail, but it's also a bit uh, confusing to work out exact numbers. Can you maybe just say, this is how many beds that we need, a total number. This is how many we are short. You're preparing some of the beds, but I'm not sure that that's going to be ready by the time you're going to get to the peak. So if you can just please expand on that. This is the number of beds we have. This is what we are short on by the time we get to the peak? And do you think that you will actually be ready when you get to that stage? If not, by what date do you think Gauteng will be ready to deal with the peak um, in all aspects? Chair, uh, the second thing I want to deal with is this issue around um, um, the grave sites as well. 
and we've seen these pictures uh, that have emerged on social media and uh, in print media and on television. Um, I understand that there has been some confusion around apparently what was being said, uh, and there's been some clarity provided. But what we saw, and what South Africans saw, was graves being prepared. Whether they've been preparing a million graves or not, or planning to do a million graves, the fact remains that those graves were being prepared. And what I'd like to know is just how many graves were prepared up until now? And what was the need for you to prepare graves when you already don't even have beds? And surely the focus should have been on getting more beds and you're short on beds and ventilators and so on. Um, what was the need for, you for, for the department to be focusing on that area? Uh, and how, how many graves uh, to date have been actually prepared? I, I gather that I, I certainly hope you haven't dug one million already. But if not, what number have you already uh, provided for? And is, is that uh, uh, a contract that has been awarded to somebody to dig up those graves? Or is it the municipality that's dealing with it with our internal resources in government? If you can maybe just give more detail about that, because um, I think that there's, there will be an active interest in that particular matter. We haven't had an opportunity to be addressed by the department on that, if you don't mind spending some time on that. Uh, may I just go back to the previous question as well and, and, and ask um, um, what is the stock of ventilators that uh, the province has um, and what, what amount do you think you will require by the time you get to the peak and will you have enough uh, to be able to meet the demand at the time? Chairperson, recently the MEC was um, was placed on leave uh, given the uh, allegations of corruption in the province. Um, I welcome the fact that uh, some action in the meantime has been has been taken and that there are investigations that are being conducted. Um, what I would like to know is I I'm told that there is there was a Gauteng audit services that conducted some form of investigation and produced a report, and that report highlighted a number of of the areas um, of uh, possible corruption in the province and in the department. Um, if you could please provide uh, some very clear information of what exactly it was uncovered and how do you actually plan to deal with it within your province. Um, given that the MEC has been on leave, um, I also understand in the media as well that uh, there has been a further 1 billion rand of purchase orders that have been suspended. and. Um, if you can maybe just comment on that, because if those purchase orders were suspended, um, uh, and naturally because they are suspicious transactions, I, I, I take, I assume that that is the reason. Um, how does that impact on the province's ability to have the necessary equipment to be able to deal with the pandemic, pandemic in the province um, if the purchase orders have been um, suspended already? Uh, and are there you know, plans to make sure that there is sufficient uh, um, uh, provisions in place to to get the necessary PPEs and whatever other uh, items that need to be purchased for hospitals. I think those are just the question. Uh, that's all the questions that I have. Uh, sorry, Chairperson, just the last question. Um, Chair, you will recall when the Western Cape was before us um, at the time when they um, when they were the epicenter of um, of COVID nineteen in South Africa. And I think Minister Lamini Zuma made a, made a raised a good point at the time, um, and I want to borrow that from her on this occasion. And she had, she asked the very relevant question, and made the very relevant comment that part of the problem in a province is when the numbers are increasing, it's often a very as a direct result of a province's inability to identify, isolate. Uh, and quarantine um, uh, people who test uh, positive uh, for COVID-19. And I take it that that's the similar reason why uh, this is happening in Gauteng and the numbers have been increasing uh, at the rapid rate that it has. So if the province can maybe explain and provide some information to us on the efforts that they are investing in respect of um, isolating people from communities as and when they find them, I understand that you can't force people to quarantine, and um, I completely get that. Um, but what measures then are you taking to make sure that those people within those communities are not spreading the virus even further and making more more quarantine sites available? From the figures that I see, I don't think that you have 100% um, capacity in your quarantine facilities. And is this an area that you're actually focusing on? Thank you very much, Chairperson.
Thank you so much, Honorable Wilson. The next speaker on the list is Honorable Mkaliki. I can see she's in already. Thank you very Mkaliki. much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, MEC, for the presentation. Uh, I will start with uh, MEC of Education, um, MEC Panyaz Ali Sufi. Uh, the numbers that you gave us here is worrisome. Uh, that is for the teachers, staff members, and learners who have contracted the virus during the, the, the first phase of of going back to school. And uh, the uh, teachers who have who are 60 years and above of age, who have uh, applied to your department MEC because they are very uh, scared to go and teach during this uh, difficult times. So therefore, I would like to know what is your plan? Because if the number is true, that suggests that is about 3,699 applicants from teachers who are above 60 years of age who are saying that you no know, they want to leave because they they can't go to to school and teach definitely show it will also disorganize your department so therefore i'd like to hear your plan uh, in this regard and uh, i think one of the presentation i'm sure it's held also touch a uh, regards to the peak that is um, a, a, a said that it will come around first of uh, mid mid August and to to to, to September. And uh, I'm just worried about this uh, news because the schools will be open uh, on the 24th of August. And it seems as if, according to the presentation of the document, when the school reopens, it will be the time of the peak again. And if the department also can share some light, what is the plans around that? Because it's not a good story to tell. Uh, also in your presentation, MEC, you spoke about infrastructure backlog, which I think also is a very problematic one. And uh, I'm sure as an activist, you saw a video that was posted by the spokesperson, the, the first spokesperson of the EFF, Dr. Komsam, we said in look before the 6th of July, where the school was supposed to reopen. Um, of the Bo, is Bo Pilong primary school. I'm not sure about the, the school, but it's in Val. And I'm sure that you saw that video, Minister. And the video was not an impressive video. It was a very, very bad of state of the school. So therefore, in your document, you talk about 103 schools that are also helped through containers. And I'm not sure if such schools is part of the one that I'm mentioning of a Komisam Hussein in those, because if you go back to that video, I'm sure even, even the chairs of the portfolio committees and the members saw that video, that was shocking. If any school in Houting is in that state, uh, and 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 if the the MEC can share with us how are you going to address such backlogs which affect the primary schools uh, with no proper toilets of which COVID-19 it needs running water and the, if the toilets are not the the one that is in, inspected how are you addressing that matter I'm sure it's not the it's not the only school that I'm referring to. There are so many schools uh, that are in that state. And on the issue of corruption in the department, if the MEC as well can also share with us as the committee, because it seems as if there is a report that spoke about three schools whereby the, there was a judgment given by the South Houting High Court after East Humboso Secondary School Solo as the primary school and new generation combined school approached the South Houting High Court demanding 15 million subsidy funds for their three independent schools. Um, it seems as if the department is aware because the department head Edward Mosio wrote an email to MEC, the good MEC Panyaza, 
on the 29th of May, confirming that the money for his Kumbuzo secondary and solo as a primary, a new generation combine had been released. However, the school's lawyers have disputed these claims. So I'm raising this uh, because it was also uh, in public since it went to court. So I'm asking myself, uh, MEC, Guti, how many such cases you have in, in, in your department? Maybe this one is just a tip of abstract. So coming to the health department, I think my colleagues have asked the one that was also on the on the news, dominating the news. As a result, that's why we have an acting health MEC uh, by the name of Jacob Mamabulu, my colleague from YCL. So therefore, if the head or the leader of delegation can also take us into confidence, because it also uh, send shocking waves to the nation uh, that also uh, include the MEC of health. Uguti, how can an MEC and the, the, the partner and all that are involved in such things uh, can happen during this pandemic? And the department, maybe the, the head of delegation can also update us Uguti, how far because I'm sure the nation is also watching this portfolio committee. And uh, maybe if the acting MEC, Jacob um, Mamabulu, can also update us. There was also um, some bad news that was also on the media about a person who wrote on Twitter by the name of Shomisani Lethole, who wrote to the Minister of Health before he died and said that in Tembisa Hospital, he died because he was not given food. And if the, the, the department have done um, the investigation in that regard, and what is the way forward? And did you also talk to the um, family of this person who died uh, under these uh, difficult circumstances? Because I think it would, it would be only fair just to go to the family end to, 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 to say to the family, you are sorry with the department, because no one must die on the, in the hands of the hospital <clears throat> if <clears throat> a person go there with a, the with a hope that he's going to get help. Also, the Tembisa Hospital and all other hospitals, like, like many hospitals in, in, in Gauteng, they are not, we do get some reports that they are not in a very uh, good state of affairs, whereby we expect that during COVID-19, uh, there will be something new. But before COVID-19, the health department in Gauteng, we are receiving bad reports. For instance, in Dr. Yasu, the new hospital, a patient by the name of Kukule Tumakuneni from Kahiso, who, who came to the hospital to give birth, and the treatment was bad in such a way that she was waiting for a long time in the passage until her baby died after she gave him the baby. And she tried to engage the department. We tried to intervene as well as members of parliament and activists, but I'm sure that you can get an official report here because it's not the first and the last uh, report that you are getting uh, from the Department of Health. So it's not a good story to tell as well. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Let me just uh, stop there allow other colleagues to take some questions. Thank you, Honorable Mkaliti. Uh, the next speaker is Honorable Oberman. Over to you, Honorable Oberman. Thank you, Chairperson. I'd like to ask MEC Lusufi through you, how much has vandalism damage cost the department to date or at least for the past six months? And how have you dealt with those schools reporting dry boreholes and poor water pressure from the local municipalities? To health, currently 102 companies are being probed for COVID-19 looting in Gauteng alone. How has COVID-19 related tender corruption affected the province? And I'd also like to know, even before the pandemic, 
billions were being looted in the health department alone. What steps have the province taken to recover those funds? And currently circulating on social media, there's allegations that you spend 13,000 rand per bed in the Nezrek Field Hospital. You bought 1,000 beds for 13 million rand. And there's also allegations that you spend 18,000 rand just on wall clocks, meaning you bought 40 wall clocks for 450 rand each. Are the SIU investigating the Nesrek Field Hospital? And how much truth are in these allegations? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable uh, Berman. Honorable Tho. Honorable Tho. In the yes, yes. Thank you, Chairperson. Can you put Let your camera first... on? Can you put your camera on first? It doesn't work. I've been trying. Yo, yo. Can you hear me, Chaperson? Hello. Okay. Yes. I, okay, okay. Yes, Chaperson. Uh, thank you very much, Chaperson. MEC for education. Yes, I worked with you and I worked very well, 100% with you. you. I can see that you are very much careful and committed with the entire school plan progress. My chairperson? Yes, proceed. We are listening to you. Yes, yes. Mm. Yes, let me see. I can see that you are very much careful and committed with the entire school plan progress and processes in counting. And for that, we thank you very much. Well done. But there were teachers that complain about uh, time lost because of COVID-19. The question is, did you develop a comprehensive intervention in drawing up a program of becoming more responsive in all timetable for all school lesson and study guide for all learners that are having lessons at home. Is there any, is, is there any problem, Chaperson? No. Oh, no, I was thinking. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, my Chaperson. Okay. Then, uh, the, and then uh, we are having uh, home teaching. We are having learners that are, are getting uh, um, teaching from home by their parents. Who is monitoring and evaluating their work that they are doing, or even marking their script and advising them for going forward in preparation for the final year exams? And I think the last one will be that also you have mentioned clearly that 35% of matrix students are not coming to school. What mechanism measures are you going to put in place so that they can come back to school and recover time wasted? And how are you going to help them to recover those time wasted? I think, oh, Chairperson, no, you are doing very well. You are doing very well. I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matlo, Honorable Tlo, Honorable Hadeva with an H. Honorable Hadeva. Yes, uh, Honorable Jefferson. Honorable Tlo, can you mute your mic, please? Honorable yeah, Tlo, yeah, can yeah. you mute? Just gadget today. What is wrong with this gadget today? Matlo, you're your your Mute your mic, please. Mute yeah, I'm busy, I'm busy. Mute it while you are quiet, please. Just, yeah, there you go. Honorable Hadev. Thank you so much. I think let me follow suit, Chair, and welcome uh, 
all presentations, they were very detailed, Chair, and they gave us um, sufficient information for us to be able to ask questions. And most of the questions have been covered by my colleagues. So I will focus on, on, on health presentation. And the March talked about and the controversial uh, procurement of uh, PPEs, Chair, in, in, in Gauteng Health Department. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it includes, uh, Chair, um, allegation of corruption, nepotism, and biasness. And, and uh, as such, there has been an outcry out there, as colleagues have alluded to. Unfortunately, those that are implicated or alleged to have benefited, uh, some are members of the executive. Now, my question to uh, the department and the leader of the delegation, um, after National Treasury issued regulations on procurement of emergency goods and services in relation to COVID-19, which included the PPEs. Immediately uh, from all corners of, of the country chair, uh, there were concern and, and a call to government that they must do everything within their power to guard against uh, a possible abuse and stealing of COVID fund. And this was based pr primarily on, on, on previous uh, experiences within government entities, government departments, municipalities that from um, Auditor General uh, audit outcomes, there has been uh, issues of misuse and abuse of uh, public funds. So such calls were made earlier before the, the, the fund could uh, be spent. Uh, including our president, uh, His Excellency Matamel, he made a call that uh, the funds ought to be used for its intended purposes. Now, I'd like to get an understanding from the department that what, what are the internal control measures in place to avoid abuse of this procurement processes? Um, over and above uh, what National Treasury has issued as regulations, can we get an understanding what processes and criteria was used in selecting these companies that benefited? We've had a very shocking and disturbing uh, uh, allegation that an official will sit in the office and go through the list and choose uh, whichever company that he or she thinks should benefit. So there's an opportunity for, for, for the Gauteng Department of Health to allay such fears and, and give us a detailed understanding of the process and the criteria uh, that was followed, uh, uh, given that we're under the emergency, uh, but certain uh, uh, checks and balances ought to have been conducted. So if we can get that understanding. Uh, the other issue that I'd like to get from the, 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 the department, how often uh, did they get to monitor uh, uh, to ascertain whether or not these internal control measures are effective? And have they seen a need uh, uh, to review uh, uh, the internal control measures based on, on their assessment of whether uh, uh, such internal control measures were effective or, or not? Um, from these uh, uh, funds, Chair, how many black SMMEs have benefited? Can the department quantify the local content in the procurement spent? Uh, how much was imported? Also, can you get an understanding uh, at, uh, that was there a, an issue or investigation conducted that ascertain whether or not there were no uh, inflating of prices. Uh, were there issues of uh, fronting? Uh, and how far are they in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, what we have seen and heard uh, on the media in terms of uh, perceiving the internal control as non-existent, 
how far have they gone to address a, a, such a, a, a shortcoming? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Khadebe. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Banyaza and uh, Mama Bulo. I, I think we we'll all agree with us with the committee that um, in this democratic government since uh, 1994, this is for the first time that uh, because of the pandemic, when a huge amount of money were dispersed without uh, following, without an open tender process. Uh, I should, you will all agree with me that there's never been a period where government acted outside the provision of section 217 of the constitution, which calls for a procurement uh, of goods and services a system that is fair, equitable, transparent and competitive, and also cost effective. As I said earlier, we must commend uh, the swift action by your premier, uh, who then uh, moved swiftly uh, in a sign of commitment to anti-corruption, transparency, and uh, openness. But then where we are seated, in May, the premier himself, he was on record saying that he is a submitted all these matters of the government to the SIU. Here, between the two of you, how far is this from the recent development uh, that we've seen happening over the past weekends? So the, 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 those are the issues that uh, one wants to raise, but then, the other issue that I want, want to raise is whether yourselves as a province have a strategy to ensure vigilance beyond the state of disaster based on the six pillar approach that we were shown to us. And then also the issue that one needs clarity about is, is your post COVID 19 economic recovery plan linked to the how things city region framework. Uh, I think the other issues that one wants to deal with is around the issue that the colleagues have raised around the issue of the uh, grade program uh, that was launched somewhere by the MEC in North Pretoria in a, in a graveyard there. Then also the MEC has been in record that uh, they are ready for 1.5 million graves as a province. Then the issues that ones want to raise on this one is that um, maybe for you, the two of you, how does the health portfolio then go to do with graves? Uh, also the issue to say, are we not then seen as if we are not um, responding to the pandemic instead of providing beds, providing ventilators to hospital because also in terms of the loss of a uh, people, especially the health personnel, including the teachers that we are hearing that have lost their lives on the line of their duty as well. Why then should we then be focusing on grades instead of making sure that we provide adequate facilities, PPEs for our doctors and the nurses and all those frontline staff that we seem to be losing than to then focus on the grades. Then the other issue that we expected to, to raise with you is with regard to the expenditure. It's with regard to the expenditure in relation, apart from the ones that are being picked up in the media space in relation to your relevant portfolios now that you lead. Um, I see MEC Mama Volo, apart from you leading a acting MEC, you are leading a particular a, a portfolio department. Are we making sure that we are in line with this and then there are no issues that are going to come at the end of this uh, 
uh, uh, they will just emerge as they're emerging because we are said as parliament we need to as we do oversight we must also be briefed on the expenditure pattern whether they are done in line with the treasury a secular as the honorable Kadewe has raised so basically this is my issues over to you MEC oh, the last one on MEC Lisuki there is a slide that deals with the positive cases in schools as per 24 July 2020, where in, in the district, I'm worried about uh, Sidibane. You said the affected school were 27, but on the closed school, the number then is 32. Was it supposed to be 22 or 12, or is just a typo error? And then uh, maybe not knowing the regions of Gautens. There's a region, I think, Johannesburg, uh, South, where in the, there's no single school that has been closed, but they were affected by 73. Is it based on the geographical spread to say uh, where, mostly where these numbers are high? Like in Swane, you have got 279 Swane South, if I'm not TS, it might mean Swane South, if you mean 279. A affected school, and then that's why you close 32. And then maybe for you to explain this variance in terms of the pandemic, is it also a based on the densification or where the schools are located? Those are the issues that I wanted to raise. Over to you, MEC Lisufi, then it will be MEC Mama Wundo in that order. Thank you so much, Chair, and let me thank members for the questions they've given us and the words of encouragement that they've extended to us. We don't take that for granted. We truly appreciate that. Chair, let me clarify the issue of the Army. It's still engagement with the Army. We are concluding a memorandum of understanding. I think it's in the presentation, and we're quite clear in the memorandum of the understanding or, or cooperation is that uh, there must not be any military action against learners. And and Mr. Is there no <coughs> any way that you can improve your light? I'm told you on TV, the nation can't see you. They want to see you. Uh, is it better, Chair? Let me see. That will sound a bit better, yes. Then you switch off the video. Honorable MC Lesufi, can I please unmute your mic as well? Am I audible? Am I audible? But you've switched off your video now. Yes, I've switched it on. Apologies if I'm darker. It's because of nature, Chair. It can't go beyond here. If I was born like chair, this, it's like Chair, this. chair, yes. chair I'd, yes. I'd, I'd raise my hand. Who's raising the hand? I, I'd raised my hand uh, much earlier, about 30 minutes ago. Who's raising the hand? Is uh, David Maimel. David Maimel as the chief of staff. David Maimel as the chief of staff in the office of the MEC for health. No, 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 no. We don't work in, no, this, in, this, committee, in this committee. You are a support staff to the MEC. Whatever you want to raise it, raise it through the MEC. The MEC Mama Vulo is here. So this is how it, it goes here. Yeah. That's why there was a delegation of official who must present who will pass that. If there are issues that you want to raise, uh, Mr. Maimela, you do it through the MEC Mamavulo. I think it's the acting MEC for him. Proceed, uh, Honorable uh, MEC Lisufi. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. I was clarifying that uh, there is a process of finalizing a memorandum of understanding with the army. Uh, reality is uh, schools have been disrupted in our, uh, in our province, and reality is that the, the, the law enforcement agencies uh, indicated that they've got a backup of the 
army as per the regulations that have been published on how the army should support the police. So it's not a choice, it's the support because we went to law enforcement agencies and that's the <clears throat> package they gave us, uh, that the army will also assist us. Uh, so they made an offer, it's not that we approach the army and on the basis of the offer because we need assistance, we have put a memorandum of understanding and within that context is that they must not um, um, harass learners or attack learners or harm learners. So we'll monitor that situation when the final memorandum of understanding is finalized. And we'll share it with the committee if the committee uh, would want that aspect. So we don't want to go on the history of the army, the conduct of the army. Uh, what we need here is to ensure that everyone is protected, the facilities are protected. I think you've seen on the report, we've got 351 schools that we've vandalized. We can't just leave it. They need to be protected, and we really believe that all law enforcement agencies uh, need to assist us uh, with the protection. And therefore, if the army and the police are available, including the, the metro police are available to protect facilities, we'll be the first one to appreciate that. Obviously, we are not ignorant uh, of some of the things that they've done before, hence the memorandum of understanding that we want to engage them explicitly indicate that they must not harm learners, must not harm students and other things. Besides, I mean, what they're doing, I really believe it's a courageous job uh, to sanitize our school and also to ensure that uh, they screen learners and also ensure that where there are cases, because they've got a medical team, where there are cases of COVID, they'll also be in a position to provide support. So it's not about skit and donor, it's about support that they need to present to all of us. So. We really, we really, really uh, appreciate that. Member Kanye also raised the issue of closure and opening of schools. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent of schools being opened, and I'll, I'll give you reasons, Chair. Uh, within the schooling environment, learners are screened before they enter the school premises. Before they enter the classroom, they are also screened. There is social distancing. They wear masks there is sanitization, they get school nutrition, they get knowledge. If the schools are closed and that they are at home, only the few continue to get those benefits. A majority of our learners don't get the benefit. If they're at home, there's no social distancing. If they're at home, they're not wearing masks, some of them. If they're at home, no one is giving them support in terms of either school nutrition and other related matters. So, our children are better off within the schooling premises. Uh, we really believe it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment that needs to be protected. Obviously, we are guided by experts. And if experts believe there will be another wave, and if experts believe that learners must be at home purely because there will be a wave, uh, we'll listen to that and we'll, 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 we'll uh, respect that kind of a decision. <clears throat> but from the academic point of view, uh, we really believe majority of learners are better off within the school environment. And those that don't want to be within the school environment, we have made processes available, the process of homeschooling and the process of lockdown schooling. Um, and, and majority of learners are taking advantage of that. So the opening and closure of schools, I don't think um, it's harming the schooling environment. But unfortunately, we are fighting a virus that we didn't know almost four months ago. We are fighting a virus that is invisible. We are fighting a virus that we don't know how long it will last. So it's going to be a trial and error process. Um, no one can give us definite answers on anything. We don't know how long it will be uh, this virus. We don't know whether next year still be here, 2022 school will be here. So we need to maneuver within the available space. Um, and I think we've, we've tried very, very hard to ensure that we maneuver within the available space and therefore it affects us. I don't have the figures of the number of teachers that are female, that are principals or the number of female teachers. I know uh, that we're, the last time, I think it's 2019, 2020, we're at least almost 50-50 uh, in terms of the number of uh, female educators and the number of male educators and also in terms of representativity uh, 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 at the principalship or SMS level, but I'm not sure in the last two years whether those figures have changed. And uh, I, I, I'm very proud. I'm one person that believes that women need to be given 
uh, uh, respect uh, need to be promoted, need to be also given opportunities, not on the basis that they're women, but on the basis that they're doing very well. And majority of our schools, uh, to be quite frank, uh, majority of our schools uh, that are led by women are doing exceptionally well. Uh, so it's within that context that I honestly feel that uh, they needed, they need to be given opportunities to run some of our schools. I'll come back later on the issue of uh, <clears throat> graves, Chair. Uh, remember, you say, I think I'll end up on the issue of the graves. Um, let me continue with other issues that were raised by Member um, Kalipi. Indeed. MEC, uh, MEC yes. Mr. Sophie, those ones that are behind you, can you tell them to play a bit far away? They are interjecting, interfering. You Let me do that, Chair. You can ask them to play away from you. Apologies, Chair. It's here. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they hardly see you, so they will always yes. see you. And it, it's yes, we time. understand. Yeah. It's still time for them, so they're waiting mm -hmm. for daily business to say some stories to them. Apologies. Okay. Remember That's why you must the open the schools. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Support that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's terrible. It's order. Remember, <laughs> indeed, the positive cases within our school premises are worrisome. What confronts us um, is that even the Department of Health have acknowledged that this, the virus spread is not happening within the school premises. It's happening within our communities. Uh, so, so these cases are not COVID cases found in our school premises. These are cases that are found through our screening. When people arrive, when we screen, we identify that the, ten the temperature is high. We take to an isolation point and we find that that person is positive. Or it's somebody say, I can't come to work because I've tested positive. So that's what encourages us. But indeed, uh, to have this number of learners testing positive and number of educators and staff members testing positive uh, is worrisome. The over 60 years applications are massive. Uh, and and, and if, if, if we can't manage them properly, I really believe they're going to give us difficulties. So, so you need to stagger it. And you stagger it using various criteria. We've got five criteria that, that we are utilizing. One is replacement easily. If replacement is easy, for example, if somebody is teaching life orientation, uh, we really believe that it, it, that particular person can be replaced. If that person is teaching mathematics, for example, it might be very difficult. If that person's comorbidities are indeed real and difficult to manage, that person can be released. So we are not releasing them at once. Uh, there are some criteria that we are utilizing uh, to determine whether those people can be released or cannot be released. And we are working on those aspects. Uh, and that's the plan that we have. Uh, that's the plan that we've put uh, on the table. Yes, there is a peak that we are, we are anticipating. We've persuaded the national minister. Uh, you will see on the new revised calendar that there is another break that learners will get. Uh, uh, I think it's around September, October, I'm not sure. Uh, but there is another break that learners will get so that we can manage uh, uh, the peak. Uh, so, so we've incorporated the peak uh, on the basis of the advice and uh, we've put that additional time. And we, we really believe that additional break uh, will assist us to, to, to deal with it. We are quite aware we've extended the academic year uh, towards the end of December, I think the 15th of December for matriculants, and the results for matric will be released around February next year. So at least uh, there is a breathing space uh, that we have uh, that is assisting us to manage uh, the situation. Let me deal with the issue of infrastructure and the, the video that was circulated by uh, your, uh, your commander. Uh, the reality is that school was battled uh, many times. The reality is that school was burned down. 
The reality is that school was deliberately vandalized. The reality is those people that were opposed to the reopening of schools targeted some of our schools and in most instances targeted the sanitation and the water, knowingly uh, that it will uh, hit a maximum damage on the basis that the COVID matter is related to water, is related to sanitation. But I'm proud to announce that we have fixed all those schools, including that school uh, that we are relating to. Um, I, I don't understand why some people will go to a public school and throw stones in a toilet seat and expect government to take place. Uh, it, 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 it's unacceptable that in all the instances where there is vandalism, people have deliberately targeted toilets and people have deliberately targeted uh, uh, water services. Uh, but as I said, uh, we've, we've, we've repaired uh, all those things. Uh, all our schools are now functional, including Kudotaro. Uh, we don't have a problem. Uh, we are also repairing the area where the school was burned. So it was a school that the community has declared war against that school. And sometimes it's impossible to accept blame when the same community is the one that have declared war against their own school. That the one that bent the school, that the one that vandalized the schools, that the one that they break it, have broken inside the school and stolen various things within the school premises. But as I said, uh, as I'm speaking to you now, all those issues have been uh, resolved. I'm aware of Skumbuzo. I'm not aware of the other two schools that you have, have, have related. Uh, and just because this matters now with the court, uh, I'm very reluctant to deposit uh, my thoughts and my thinking on how we need to. But I can give you a general statement. Remember, it is not automatic or compulsory to subsidize schools. Those schools that need subsidies, they are basic minimum things that they must do. And one of the things that stops us from funding schools is the issue of the utilization of the funds that we provide to that school. If they can't account for those funds, uh, we can't release the funds. But also, if there are whistleblowers from the school that indicate that there are things that are not correct at that particular school, we'll also not release those uh, those resources. But uh, the three schools, I will check them, uh, Member Kalipi, and I will be in a position to give you feedback uh, if there is a need for us uh, to put that in writing uh, as well. We, 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 we will come back on the issue of the acting MEC and other related matters that have raised Member Mkalipi. Uh, when, when I sum up before I give to MBC Mama Bulo to, uh, to speak on those issues. So we, we, we'll clarify the, the acting part and the current actions that we are taking as provincial government on matters related to the Department of Health. Uh, Member Opperman, I don't have figures, but I can tell you vandalism is costly. Uh, we really believe uh, there is a deliberate campaign by those that are opposed to the reopening of schools to deliberately vandalize our schools so that uh, their views can be heard. Uh, it's costly, uh, and I can tell you it runs into uh, lots and lots of uh, funds uh, that need to be deposited. Uh, so we'll consolidate uh, the figures uh, and, and, and share with you as soon as we get those particular figures, including the issues that we've raised about dry boreholes and low water pressure. Metro, thank you so much, ma'am. I miss you as well. I mean, uh, I worked uh, nicely and closely with you. I was actually comforted when I saw your name here, uh, uh, that I'm not lost. I'm still in your company. Uh, you, you, you honestly took care of some of us when we were, we were new in the legislature. You guided us rather than uh, uh, abandon us, and I'm humbled that I'm still in your company. Teachers that are complaining about uh, uh, time lost, I think it was prior to the change of the academic calendar. Now that we've changed the academic calendar, we really believe that will accommodate some of them. But the reality is that we've lost almost three months. Uh, we've lost almost three months, and that is why we needed to, to trim the, uh, 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 the, the, the curriculum, but most importantly, change the annual teaching plans so that we can accommodate this reality. 
Uh, but let's hope that with the amended timelines now, uh, we can be in a position to respond uh, to some of the uh, concerns that teachers uh, were raising. We're giving them study guides, yes. We're giving them radio lessons, television lessons. We're giving them PowerPoints, presentations. We're giving them lots of support uh, so that at least they don't have to struggle uh, to deliver those lessons. Uh, if there's something that worries me, is the 35% the number of learners that are still not back at school. We can't afford to have this kind of a situation, especially in our country. Uh, our skills base is minimal. The only way to fight poverty and the only way to fight inequality and the only way to ensure that our children don't miss out on out of opportunities is through education. It's not through social grants. Uh, so, so, so if they can't get education, uh, we're going to revert back to the situation that wants to rectify. So if we have this large number of learners that are at metric, uh, that are not at school, we should be worried as a country. Uh, and we are worried as a province. Hence, we felt that we need to stabilize our schooling environment so that people are not intimidated to come to school. We need to ensure that uh, our online support is there. We also need to ensure that those without uh, computers are also given work to do. So we are monitoring that situation very closely. Uh, it's something that uh, needs our immediate uh, uh, attention. Uh, uh, Member Khatib, I'll come back as well on the issue of uh, our, our uh, procurement uh, abuse. Um, and, 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 and uh, related matters. I think I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that issue later on. Chair, I've taken a, a note of the issues you've raised as well, and, and I want to highlight the one that you've raised about the graves. Uh, I think on behalf of the Houghton government, we need to apologize to our people, to society. I think there was a serious miscommunication on the issue of the graves. Uh, and we have no reason not to apologize to our people. Uh, it was wrong. Uh, completely misunderstood and completely unacceptable. We can't use anything to justify it, nor can we say something uh, 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 to, 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 to register our disappointment. We are disappointed in the manner in which it was communicated. Reality is how the government does not have a policy or strategy on digging graves. Um, what we communicated was that we wanted to consolidate the number of graves that are available from all our municipalities. I think in that process, the message didn't go well. And for that, we apologize. Uh, and we will not have ways to justify. And I don't think that he wants to justify it. Uh, we are sorry. It was communication went wrong. And we really believe that culturally, those that we, 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 we communicated this thing about graves and it affect them, it affected them badly. Here we are as Houghton government, uh, and they're saying unconditionally, without any conditions, uh, we are deeply sorry. Uh, we don't have an agenda to bury our people. We have an agenda to heal our people. Uh, we don't have our agenda uh, to throw people into graves. We have an agenda to ensure that people go home because we've given them the necessary medication. And for that, we apologize. So I don't want to justify it or say it in any other way or form it. Uh, and I think that uh, we'll find it in our heart to also accept uh, our apology. In terms of the MEC chair, we, 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 the Premier took that decision, and on the basis of the decision that the Premier stated, the Premier also uh, made arrangements that the law enforcement agencies, in particular the SIU, must go through all the accounts. Uh, we've given them four weeks, between four weeks to six weeks, to go through those accounts. We are pleading for patience here. Uh, there is a clear amendment or, or, or relationship that uh, uh, the president also signed that allows the SIU and other law enforcement agencies to go through all the accounts. And they must go through all the accounts. Uh, and I think there is no single account uh, that we say is not going to be touched. And within six weeks, we'll be in a position to share with you that information. But if you want us to share with you that information now, it's going to be practically impossible because we don't have. Uh, it's a process that we believe it needs to be sorted out and needs to be concluded. And we need experts. And we need people that have the legislative mandate and the power to investigate these accounts. And I think that dealing uh, with those uh, particular accounts. But for now, 
as a provincial government, we have taken a decision to monitor all the other related accounts. And I think there have been reports that some of those particular accounts have been stopped uh, or they've been investigated and in a position to deal with whatever that we need to do. What we have done now, because we centralized the work of, of, of PPEs in Gauteng with the Department of Health, now we've decentralized it back to all departments uh, so that the, the, the responsible line managers, that is the HODs, can take full responsibility uh, for this kind of work. So we will, when we get those reports, share, share them with you and indicate that uh, this kind of report or whatever that has happened, uh, we'll be in a position to give you a report on how we've dealt uh, with those particular issues. I want to leave it there, Chair. Sorry, I want to leave it there, Chair, uh, and, 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 and leave it to uh, MEC uh, Jacob Mamagulo uh, to deal with specific health matters together with the HOD in the areas that he wants to. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, MEC Yusufi. Over to you, MEC Mamagulo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and members. <clears throat> Let me. I don't know if you. I don't know if you can hear me, Chair. Let me see. Can you please put your camera on? We haven't seen you since you joined this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Chair. Um, <clears throat> Yes, MEC Mama Bulo, can you see him, Kaliki? Proceed, Madebanao, the MEC. Okay, to to <laughs> optimize the the <clears throat> the volume chair, I'll prefer to close it if it's okay, so that we can have a good quality uh, voice coming out. Eh? So now, chair, the the, 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 the first thing. <laughs> The first thing, Chair, I would like to say is uh, just to apologize on the on on what happened from our side. Um, sincere apologies about uh, <clears throat> about that earlier um, uh, Charlie problem we had. I, I really want to profusely apologize, but secondly, to reaffirm your intervention, Chair, you were absolutely right, and thank you very much for that. Uh, intervention um, and hope our apology will be accepted. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again. The Don't second worry, issue, Chair, is there's nothing to worry about. Let me see. That's why I said you are the line of authority. Whoever wants of these things must do that through you, unless they're delegated by yourself to do such. Thank you very much. Now, the <clears throat> two things I'd like to say. One is that I think MSC the Sufi has dealt with the, with the issues that both yourselves and members raised, uh, particularly around um, uh, the graves, uh, the issue of the graves. And I think uh, let me just confirm and reaffirm what um, uh, MSC the Sufi said. And uh, we will definitely. Uh, get that uh, behind us and focus on the task of saving lives of our people. So, so I think let me see this if it helped with that issue. Let me just confirm that yes, in terms of fighting corruption, I also want to welcome and 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 uh, sincerely appreciate your positive feedback about um, the premier's very detailed and comprehensive address he made last week. Um, on Thursday, uh, in which uh, he really reaffirmed the position of the provincial government to root out corruption. Uh, and, 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 and that uh, the matters currently, all of them relating to, to COVID-19 supply chain logistics and procurement are well firmly placed in the hands of our law enforcement agencies and at this point, Chair, we would like to appeal that uh, let's allow the law enforcement agencies <clears throat> to deal with these matters and deal with them decisively. We have confidence that um, we 
we will get to the bottom of this issue uh, and we'll be able to deal with, with these issues um, in promptly and swiftly. And I'd like to assure members about that. The, the other issue, Chair, that I just want to raise uh, is that um, I have uh, just since I was appointed on, uh, on and, 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 and starting on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we finished today. Uh, we visited about um, uh, 26 institutions, health facilities, and uh, this include the two storage facilities for PPE, one located in Centurion and the other one located in Rodeport, where one has clearly seen what is happening with PPE, where is it, its availability, and understood the issues around PPE. I would like to assure members that um, we are also dealing with this matter. I know the DG is also in the meeting. She also visited the two facilities that are dealing with PPE. And um, following this uh, challenge that we have had in the pro province, uh, I can assure you that um, we will make an announcement on this issue um, on how we are going to comprehensively deal with this matter based on my observations and those of the Director General in the province. But there's no doubt, and uh, the Premier said it himself, we will, as a province, make sure that the distribution and allocation of PPE to our health workers and workers in general across government departments is done in the most efficient and effective way. And the particular and specific details of that, we will announce them uh, and we can send out uh, reports uh, to the committee on uh, just how we are going to deal with these matters once we have consolidated uh, our reports um, uh, just in tomorrow and, um, and Friday. I'm quite sure, Chair, I want to commit that we will update the committee. Uh, I commit myself to do that on how we are going to deal with this matter of PPE moving forward to make sure that we can protect um, the, 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 the workers in the provincial government and those in the front line. The other matter that um, I just want to comment on is that having made observations in the hospitals, and I just completed this today, and HOD can speak to that issue, I'll ask him to come in just now, is that uh, we are ready for the, for, the, for the peak and the storm that is coming uh, in the period that has been announced based on the scientific models that have been done. And uh, where there are still challenges, I'm quite sure that we will be able to close and tighten up the loose ends. But honorable members can be rest assured that um, the provincial government will be able to manage uh, um, the, the, the peak period. And there are issues about HR capacity, infrastructure, devices and equipment. Uh, there are matters of... Um, um, <clears throat> uh, PPE itself, and um, and I'm quite sure that we will be able to to make sure that we respond adequately to the challenge that is facing us in the next few weeks. So to that extent, Chair, I just want to ask HOD uh, to speak to the questions about um, the beds availability and the issues of supply chain lists. If um, and those we can sub we can. We can submit them, Chair, uh, formally in writing um, uh, uh, as part of the information. I would want to ask that you permit us to, to send you the list of these companies, um, and, and I commit to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll email it to your office, uh, Honorable Chair. And uh, I just want to to speak to the issue of beds and uh, any other matter uh, that he might want to speak to, I'd like to delegate him, but only and exclusively the HOD. And also, Chair, if you don't mind, the Director General is in the meeting. If she wants to say something, I'm pleading that you allow her to say. But otherwise, MEC Lesufi has well covered uh, the issues that have been raised. And uh, at this point, let me let me ask HOD to just say very few points, and then the DG, if there's any. And just before, Chair, can I just say to... Honorable um, Kalipi, that um, 
I'll give a call <laughs> offline about uh, uh, our YCL matters. Uh, she's still welcome to come back. She's our product, a very good investment we have made. And uh, we, we also have the right of recall. Uh, but <laughs> we will take off that line and I'll give you feedback about uh, um, recalling our member uh, from <laughs> where, we, where she is now. Uh, this is our product, this is our investment, and uh, I can assure you we will get back what belongs to us very soon, before the storm. Order, national coordinator of YCL. Order, 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 order. There's no order in this meeting, Mukalipi. You know that we don't do orders. We deliberate on matters here. Uh, over to you, HOD. Chair, we are not neutral on this matter. It explains her behavior, Chair. Now I can understand why. Yeah. Let's allow the HOD to respond to issues as delegated by the MEC, please. Hey, Jody. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 thank you, honorable members, and uh, thank you, MEC, for allowing me to answer the question on uh, the availability of beds. Uh, yeah, I think we had required. I had in terms of uh, the critical, which is the ICU and high care beds, uh, on the six. HOD, HOD, you seem to be having a very serious network. Am I am I audible? Am I audible? That's better. Am I audible? No. The chair now. You, now. Stay put. Let's hear again. Let's try. Can the chair hear me now? Yes. You stay put like that. You continue like that. Okay? Proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. With regards to critical beds, by September, uh, beginning of September, we, we according to our model, we required uh, 2,400 beds. And at that time, uh, we will, uh, we, we moved from the current 373 beds and we have now 2,378 beds, meaning that we uh, calculated that we will be 22 beds short. But, but I want to uh, implore on the members that this disease is changing. The treatment is changing. The number of ventilators which uh, we need are less because our clinicians are now using a different method, especially with the introduction of dexamethasone. So we are confident that uh, in terms of the ICU and high care beds, we are ready. In terms of uh, the ward beds, we had estimated according to our model that uh, we need 7,500 beds. And with all the intervention which we've made, uh, the gap indicates that uh, 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 there may only be a, 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 a 3,000 beds, uh, 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 which uh, uh, may be shortfall. But then we've compensated those by including what you call the fever 10, and also we are strengthening all our CHC, that is, uh, 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 services. And we're also uh, uh, strengthening the services of the private practitioners in our various wards uh, to come into this uh, space. So um, in other words, we believe that uh, with the preparation, we are ready and we won't be uh, uh, short of beds, especially with the fact that we increased with the field hospitals at uh, Nasrec and the field hospital, which is uh, 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 going to be at, uh, 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 at Twane. And we've identified another hospital in the city which uh, will be available for us to use. Uh, uh, in terms of the next person, uh, 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 next question on controls, right from the 17th of April, we then started putting controls after um, a letter was written to uh, a, a, a audit committee to assist us, where we separated the role of uh, 
payment and the role of uh, supply chain. And there was already an established uh, provincial supply chain, which was chaired by uh, DDG supply chain from uh, the Depart Provincial Treasury. We also established uh, the bid uh, evaluation committees, which was chaired by people out of uh, the Department of Health and the bid adjudication uh, committee. And uh, the MC has indicated the controls at the warehouse were also uh, improved. MEC uh, members, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Chair, so can, I, can I allow just, the, the Please, the, Chair. The, the, yes, MEC? Yeah, can I just say, I thought HOD would also speak to these issues of um, what happened in Tembisa Hospital, uh, uh, the incident that happened, and uh, the one um, in, um, I think it's in Katehong. Um, yes. Uh, can I can I commit to go and investigate this? Um, Honorable uh, Mkalipu was asking if we visited the family. Uh, at this point, no, I'll check, but I commit to visit uh, this family and we will send a report on the investigations. I just didn't want to leave these two issues, but we can ask DG to say something. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And then it's your D local. Are you able to give feedback now that the MEC has just been appointed to act on the matters as raised by Honorable uh, Mukalipi, failing which then will follow the line that the MEC is proposing? But I think it should be, this is information at your disposal. I see on the other matter you even issued a statement disputing what was said by that uh, patient. Before the DG. HOD, look at it. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, yes. I can hear uh, you. Can, can the Chair hear me now? Yes, you are loud and clear. Yes, uh, Thank, thank you very much, Chair. On the would like to share the report with the committee, but uh, uh, it was uh, thoroughly investigated, and uh, is uh, a, a lot of correction in the information which was uh, presented with regard uh, to the. Uh, the investigation on the on the twins and at uh, at Chris Hane Baraguanas is a process which we have initiated the investigation, and the results of that investigation will also come through, uh, as uh, we have already found that uh, some of the uh, articulations were not uh, truthful. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, MEC. Okay, that's the matter that the MEC then will carry forward and share with us. DG, DG of the province of Gauteng. Good evening, Chairperson. Good evening, members of the portfolio committees. Good evening to the emissaries from Gauteng and the colleagues. Uh, uh, Chairperson, there isn't much really that I'd like to add. I align myself with the points that have been made by both MEC Lusufi and MEC Mamabolu, just to underscore the fact that we were very concerned about the control environment right from the beginning of the implementation of the COVID response. So a number of uh, control mechanisms were put in place over and above the traditional ones that would have existed in the departments. So for instance, we, we, we appointed other CFOs and some DDGs to support the CFO in the Department of Health. We, we ran the internal audit reviews as a matter of oversight of our internal controls to check whether our internal controls were working. And it was during that process that we discovered some of the problems. So the areas that we had requested that be reviewed, especially by the outing audit services, was food distribution and food parcels. There were lots of issues in the atmosphere around that. It was the issues of donations plus procurement. Right at the like within a month of the project starting, we, we reviewed those and it was done just purely in the interest of good governance and ensuring that our controls were working. And where they were not working, we discovered what the deficiencies were. And in fact, 
that led to the forensic investigation being instituted in May, with the SIU taking a site around the 4th of June to investigate, and they have um, they, they, they have been investigating up until now, although they haven't given us reports. So as undertaken by the MECs, once those reports have been availed by the SIUs and others who are investigating, the information will be shared with the committees. I thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, DG. Thank you so much. Then colleagues, are there follow-up questions? Hi, Chair. Kalipi. Okay, it's the three of you thus far. I'll start with you, Hadeve. Thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson, and to uh, Honorable colleagues in in in, in Gauteng. Chair, I am mindful of the fact that. Some of the issues are before the SIU. As such, it will be practically impossible for us to get a, a, a detailed response. But my question, uh, Chair, was in relation to the internal control measures in place. Uh, I'd ask whether or not, especially in the Department of Health, do they have adequate internal control measures in place to avoid what was highlighted as potential uh, danger, that of the abuse of COVID-19 funds. And if there were such internal control measures in place, how often were those reviewed? I even ask you, Chair, uh, that we were told, uh, we heard over the media, of instances where an official will sit in front of his or her a computer, go to the list of service provider, and just pick one and appoint. Whether or not such uh, reports are true, if not, can we be given uh, an understanding of a criteria and a process followed in dealing with emergency procurement over and above what was uh, uh, issued by National Treasury as a regulation. Uh, how did you ensure that the price of procurement uh, 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 systems uh, uh, that were utilized ultimately resulting in the service provider appointed those price that you received were uh, uh, a price that are cost effective. Uh, is it not just a case of one looking on the list and choosing the name that he feels comfortable with? So I would like to get such an understanding. A detail, uh, yes, I agree, Chair. We can wait for a detailed response from the SIU. But for now, because uh, uh, things are continuing, there will be other uh, 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 goods and services that are going to be procured. There will still be a need for appointment of service provider outside the normal procurement processes. We want to be comfortable as this committee that moving forward, there are measures in place and the system adequately to keep what uh, 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 transpired and what is there in the public domain. I think that cannot wait for SIU to give its outcome. It's something that you ought to have uh, put in place now if you didn't have in uh, previously. So I want to get uh, that understanding, Honorable. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Khadeve. Honorable Hussein. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, show appreciation for the um, the apology that um, um, MEC Lasufi had uh, had made on the issue of the graves, and I mean, I'll just say that you know I think if more MECs and ministers in our government have to apologise in the manner in which he did for the mistakes that they make, I think our country will be in a better place. So I appreciate the the manner in which he's done it. Uh, I think it was uh, humble of him to do that, and I appreciate that. 
you know, when this matter emerged, Chairperson, and I, I, it's not my intention to keep the item alive. Uh, I accept, uh, uh, you know, the, the explanation that's provided. But there was also a second part to this issue around the graves, which was the perception that was created in the public domain that this thing around the grave sites that were being dug up was an opportunity created for some company to get a tender. So not only were people, you know, uh, uh, angry about the fact that a government was digging up graves rather than buying beds, but the perception that was created was that this thing was about creating some opportunity for the company, which is why I asked the question, you know, just how many of these things were, were dug up and was it, was it done by a contractor or was it part of a tender? Uh, or is it just the municipality doing the thing? So uh, I think that the that 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 the MEC Lusuki must, if we can just explain that part and then we move on from this point, so that at least we have the sense of confidence that you know the ma the matter is under control. If it was a t tenderer, so be it, and if it's being investigated, well, that's also good. But at least that information, I think, he must kindly share with us. Uh, but I thank him for the for the response in which uh, in the manner in which he has responded on that matter. Thank you, Chair. much honorable Lucen. the next speaker is honorable Mkalipi. thank you very much chair uh, i know and i also agree that the mec who's acting as an mec for health can't have all answers since he is acting but i think that he can also take us into confidence of what happened today uh, in mamelo the hospitals chair uh, I have put on the group whereby the resident barricaded the major streets due to power failures that has not since been attended to. So I think because it happens while he is in Missy, I'm sure he will be privy to the information. <laughs> My national uh, coordinator of the YCL. And then secondly, uh, I know that MEC Lusufi uh, will also come back as a leader of delegation. MEC, I agree with Honorable Hussein that uh, we are in the MEC who is very responsive. Whenever we send you SMSs to say, please intervene, there is a child who is out of school. You just respond and you act. But I think that there was, um, uh, I don't know, maybe you forgot or I don't know what happened because it's unlike you. On the message of for the 28th of June, whereby a, a, a name of a young person, Morgane Mutudi, who's a student at UJ, who was also sharing his story, which is very, very, very sad. And then I ask you to intervene. I know that the MEC who is um, acting as an MEC for social development is coming tomorrow. Maybe if you have forgotten to intervene in that child, and if you can also uh, send that SMS as a form of intervention, to the MEC tomorrow can also update us because that child, she wants to continue with his studies as he's studying in UJ, studying engineering, but uh, his mother does not have a house and also she is not even renting and they are living behind the CC church. And, and sometimes they don't have electricity in order to charge, to charge his gadgets in order to assess his studies. I think that one is also very critical MEC. Those are the two items uh, that I wanted to make a follow-up on. Thanks very much. The, the, thank you, Honorable Mukalipi. There is a slide that uh, strikes me. It's with regard to our correctional facilities. I think uh, as the HOD was presenting, he made reference of the death of two correctional officers. I think MEC one has got interests that maybe you can then do a breakdown of all the correctional facilities in the province and in terms of the number of a, a pay, pay, pay facilities so that you are able to look at that as part of the information that you are going to, to submit. The other issue, uh, which we believe is attributing to, to the increase of infection and death of uh, healthcare workers is the lack of poor 
quality PPEs. I'm glad that since you took over office on Friday, MEC Mamavulo, you've been making rounds to understand this. So it's our view that there is a need for a robust quality assurance measures on the PPEs being procured. And then uh, we are told that the mere fact that now already there are over 150 healthcare workers and nurses that have succumbed to COVID due to the lack of quality, poor quality PPEs. I wanted you to, to respond to such allegation, but nevertheless, seated here, I just got something from a, 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 a specialist practitioner who's saying that I think you must hear it to MEC Mamabulo that you sound promising and enthusiastic, and then you are bringing hope to the profession. Be as it may be, can you then deal with all these issues that you have been raised by the colleagues in that order? Uh, I think I'll start with you, Honorable Mamabulo, and Ms. City will come after you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, for that positive feedback. I'm deeply, uh, deeply appreciative of that uh, uh, warm words of encouragement. We will do our best. Now, I just want to say that um, I agree that uh, the issue of um, the robustness and uh, effectiveness of our internal controls to deal with the issues that um, uh, have actually came out in the province, particularly those controls in dealing with supply chain, uh, procurement, logistics, and actually oversight on those uh, have proven beyond any shade of doubt that we need to we need to deal with them. And I'd like to assure members that. Um, we will go, and, and I don't think we should be defensive about this issue or try to put it anyway. We will go back to the drawing board and look at internal controls as prescribed and defined by the Public Finance Management Act, including the Public Service Act as it relates to human resources. And uh, I think uh, one of the issues that uh, we will immediately look at is also the effectiveness of our um, uh, governance structures that are made to prevent very proactively loopholes, leaks that lead to collusion, to fraud, to corruption, to theft, and generally undermining uh, PFMA, wasteful, irregular, and all those uh, cohorts that uh, are dealt with by PFMA. So one of them I would like to just uh, assure members that uh, we will conduct a quick audit on in the next uh, few days is our own internal audit uh, capacity, because that is one instrument provided by PFMA, which in terms of proper governance will be able to help us see the risk, including the risk audit risk profile of, um, of the department. So these are matters that we will look at. DG dealt with some of them. And um, I think this is one area that um, we will definitely look at. Um, we are also, uh, the issue of um, um, the coordination of um, auditor, auditor uh, AG's office, uh, SIU law enforcement, um, the Premier has spoken about um, uh, conducting uh, lifestyle audits, even of ourselves, um, and the senior leadership of the department all those interventions combined. Um, we will look at them, but at this point, I think the low hanging fruit to look at the, to scan the environment, to protect the department procurement in supply chain uh, is to look at the effectiveness of uh, internal audit function. And that is the most immediate one that I want to assure members that one will look at and uh, just check with them, how did things fall, um, into cracks. So that's that's one matter and one matter that I want to assure members that we will look at and see the levels and areas of exposure 
uh, that may actually cause problems. So we will make sure that we close all the leaking taps whilst we fight corruption and people that have been uh, that are going to that will be found to be on the wrong side of PFMA and any other uh, legislative controls. We will deal with them without fear or favor and, or prejudice, and we'll deal with those issues decisively. And that's what I'd like to assure members. Uh, Chair PPE, uh, in actual fact, we are appointing uh, what we call PPE uh, champions, which is a directive that the uh, Minister uh, of Health, Dr. Zwelim Kiz, has given two days ago. And uh, in the province, we have started to establish uh, those champions. And uh, there are other uh, uh, controls and systems. One is working well at Charlotte McCleke, which helps actually to deal with this issue of PPE from uh, uh, quantitative supply, uh, availability, accessibility, quality assurance, and also making sure that um, there's proper accountability uh, on, on, on the PPE. So, so there is best practice that we will, we will introduce uh, to make sure that workers uh, are not vulnerable. Let me also ensure, assure members, in Centurion uh, 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 facility and um, uh, the storage facility or warehouse in Centurion and um, Rio de Port, we have adequate supply of PPE. I can assure you, I can confirm quantities of PPE are adequate at the current moment. The problem is distribution. And of course, when we deal with these issues of corruption, we will have to look at those companies that are found to be on the wrong side of supply chain policy. Obviously, we'll have to confront that, but I can assure you that with the quantities that we have stored in these facilities, we will be able to transition to a proper process without compromising the current operations. So on that, I think members, uh, we should be able to manage the transition from where we are into a much more better, uh, efficient and effective environment uh, on the PPE matter. As I did say, um, the, 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 the violence that happened in, um, in Mami Lodi uh, today, yes, uh, it was about uh, electricity in the city of Tswani and uh, community members took to the streets. There was a perception that it was about taxi problems. That has been clarified, corrected, and actually the Mami Lodi Amalgamated Taxi Association has issued a statement clarifying that. And I can assure members, the police, uh, law enforcement, the taxi industry and stakeholders have opened the routes. The matter is cleared. Tomorrow we're looking forward to a much more stable operation in, in Mami Lodi. We're not at anticipating uh, any, any problem. So to that extent, Chair, let me, I hope I have uh, tried to deal with the, with the issues, but um, the reports that we have committed to give to members, we will definitely do that. And I still commit to do a visit to the Tembisa family that um, uh, Honorable Mkalipi raised. But otherwise, she, let me leave it here. If there's any matter, HOD can come in. But otherwise, uh, we're looking forward to improving the robustness of accountability and uh, make sure that we uphold the constitution as we say, Chair, and the legislation regulating our work. With regard to the quality and quality assurance of those PPEs that might be in stock, does the matter that need to be looked at? Because there's an allegation to say, though they are there in numbers, but the quality leaves much to be desired. But is the matter that you can look on? Yes, Chair. Yes. Yes. Because the numbers might be more in stock, but the quality is what the health professionals are complaining about. I complain. Yes. Yeah. That is true, Chair. We'll deal with that matter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me start with the issues that were raised by Member Mkalipi. I can see that the date you are referring to, Member Mkalipi, that's the date I was instructed to be in isolation. So uh, I, I really apologize. I'll, I'll indeed pass. 
the request, I've, I've gone through the request, I think uh, we will attend to it. Apologies that we took time to respond to that one. Uh, member, you say it's very difficult to indicate whether uh, there was a tender for the digging of graves. Uh, let me tell you why, because this responsibility lies with local government. Uh, municipalities are the one that have a mandate to dig graves. Uh, so it will be extremely difficult to know whether they were doing it using their own staff members or they were outsourcing it to other service providers. But it's the information that we can get and share with you. Uh, what we wanted to emphasize, and I think we are appreciative of uh, the acceptance of our apology, what we wanted to apologize is that we don't have a strategy or a program as government especially as the Houghton Provincial Government, to dig uh, one million graves. Uh, it's not in our plans, it's not part of our plans, it's not going to be part of our plans. So if there was this communication breakdown or miscommunication, uh, we once more apologize for that and we will make a follow-up on the issues that we've raised. We, 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 we really believe that the focus and the energy now uh, should, and should, should, should be directed to ensure that the Department of Health succeed. Uh, I think the Premier was very clear that uh, the, the, the issues of the PPEs and the issues that are now in the public domain concerning the Department of Health has taken us backward on the work that we've put uh, to ensure that we push back the virus, but most importantly, we flatten the curve. Uh, but now that we've put systems, and now that there is an acting MEC, and now that um, there, there are law enforcement agencies that are investigating these matters, we really believe that we should now channel our energy in ensuring that we indeed flatten the, 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 the curve, but most importantly, uh, be ready uh, for the next wave if it comes, uh, in terms of the number of beds, in terms of the support to the doctors and those that are working uh, in the health sector, and most importantly, uh, to assure our people that when they come to our facilities, they will get help, uh, and, and we will we, we'll work around those issues. Member uh, I think MEC Mama will have tried to explain the internal control measures uh, that we need to strengthen. The mere fact that we are in the uh, we, are, we are occupying front pages of various media houses and we are hitting the headlines. It's quite, it's quite an indication that there are limitations. So, so we need to go back and close those limitations. Uh, if you check uh, the institutions that have been given some of the work they need to do, some are in the advertising, some are in the construction, some are... So, so, so it's quite clear that there are gaps. Uh, and I won't even question uh, the assertion that you are giving that someone would just take a decision where they are that I'm appointing this company. Uh, so we need to close those gaps. But in dealing with these matters, which is something that I want to caution uh, to all members, we must not reverse our desire to ensure that legitimate good companies are given the work by government. And we must refrain to paint everyone who has provided services as corrupt. And we must not fall into the temptation that unknown equals a good tender, the known equals a bad tender. Because if you take that stream, I really believe that will reverse the gains of empowerment, will reverse the gains of ensuring that the markets are open for everyone and that there's no domination through race or wealth of a certain sector. Uh, because I can tell you from where I am now, when you see this kind of things, you, you, you start to say, hey, maybe I must have a certain CFO of a certain race. I know that the Auditor General won't question me. I know I won't get the question from the newspapers. I know I'm not going to get the question from the legislature. If I appoint this kind of a person or appoint this kind of a company, that is why. So I'm saying, what we need to do and what we need to emphasize, let's provide opportunities to all South Africans that are capable, talented, and they've got the capacity. Uh, but if it takes a shape of race and it takes the shape of who has the financial muscle, I really believe that it will exclude other people. So it's just a caution uh, so that 
We don't paint everyone as a bad person, uh, but those that are bad, we must hunt them, we must be merciless to them, and if needs be, they must bring back the resources that they've taken from the state. So there we must not be apologetic, but we need to caution uh, that if we paint everyone uh, with a certain paint without going deeper into details, we'll miss an opportunity of ensuring that these opportunities are given to all our people. I want to leave it there, Chair, but thank you once more uh, for the opportunity and thank you for, for, for giving us uh, 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 this time uh, for us to share what we're doing within the province of Gauteng. I think we'll see you tomorrow if uh, time permits, Chair. Thank you once more for the engagement. Definitely, Thanks. Definite, definitely we're going to proceed tomorrow and it will be good that the two of you, MECs and the DG and the HOD still attend tomorrow's proceeding because these matters are interlinked. And it will be it will be good to have you in the meeting. Colleagues, we've already exhausted parliament time by almost um, 37 minutes. We are still proceeding tomorrow. Can we end it here? Then we'll meet yes. at 6 yes, Yes, we we'll meet at six tomorrow. Thank if you, are issues that they are not adequately addressed, the two MECs will still be here with us tomorrow. So that yes. brings Thank us you, to and that brings us to the end of tonight's meeting. Till we meet at six again tomorrow. I want to thank everybody who has made time to attend this meeting. I see Dr. Tau is amongst us. DM Bapella joined the meeting later after we started and then asked to be excused. But we must congratulate our colleague, uh, Honorable Kornevald. He tendered an apology. He just been blessed with the baby girl some hours ago. Ow! Oh, so shit. these cocktail babies are eating numbers now. We cocktail babies. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night, Good Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.